Good evening. This is the False Flag Islamophobia Conference going live from Paris, France. It is evening here. It's uh, morning on the West Coast, USA, afternoon in the Middle and East Coast. Uh, but over here in Paris, we're raring to go for a full four-hour session here, talking with some of the great minds of our time, getting to some of the real issues beneath the frightening rise of Islamophobia that's being witnessed all over the world, a kind of globalized phenomenon. We came here to participate in another Islamophobia conference, the Islamophobia and Civil Society Conference, sponsored by people from the University of California, Berkeley. Tony Hall and I attended. And so let me go ahead and introduce Tony and let him talk about what he thinks our conference is really all about. Professor Tony Hall is a professor uh, from the University of Lethbridge. He teaches globalization studies there. And he's uh, produced a couple of brilliant books. It's the uh, Bowl with One Spoon series that's gotten high praise from uh, a number of reviewers, including some mainstream sources. Uh, so Tony is one of the brave independent voices who isn't afraid to ask the hard questions about issues like Islamophobia and what's really behind the war on terror, as well as other issues. So take it away, Professor Tony Hall. Thank you. And uh, of course, we're presenting this uh, as a conference, a kind of academic conference, Kevin. <clears throat> and uh, Kevin Barrett, of course, uh, worked uh, teaching at the University of Wisconsin and uh, was uh, drummed out of his job for speaking the truth, for including in the curriculum some uh, skeptical commentary, including it among a range of opinions on what happened on 9-11, and uh, became a kind of martyr uh, and a kind of uh, indicator that there's something very wrong with the academy when it comes to the issue of identifying the truth of what did happen and didn't happen on 9-11, what the evidence will support and not support. And so this has become a kind of underlying theme and of course the world continues to unfold and I would argue that because we didn't come to terms with 9-11, because society generally, our governments, civil society, much of the media, never really dealt with what happened on 9-11 and what didn't happen and who did what to whom, what we're seeing now, we're sort of on the brink of a sort of global war with Syria at the center with the United States and Russia and Iran on the other side where superpowers are facing each other. This is uh, part of the outgrowth of a failure to address what happened on 9-11. I have to thank Kevin. Uh, in 2008, I had a kind of catharsis, my 9-11 catharsis, and it was my friend and colleague splitting the sky, a Mohawk activist, who insisted that a I... A lawyer, Hamhu. That's a rest in peace. In the, yes. In uh, yes, and, uh, you know, splitting the sky was a great colleague. He was charged with killing a cop in Attica in 1971. <clears throat> and it became a kind of celebrated case, and his lawyer became Ramsey Clark. And, and he had this kind of a, a major illustrious background. He'd spent much of his life in prison. And uh, so he uh, was a sort of self-taught jailhouse lawyer. You know, he'd been on death row, essentially, and learned the law. And he started to apply himself to 9-11, and that drew me in. And my first invitation to speak on the issue was on Truth Jihad from Kevin Barrett. And uh, so Kevin Barrett proceeded, uh, you know, we, we kind of teamed up and when Splitting the Sky attempted a citizen's arrest of George W. Bush in Calgary, Alberta, which is near where I live and teach at the University of Lethbridge, uh, he was arrested and we had a kind of process where although it was a charge technically against Splitting the Sky, he had done what he did, attempt a citizen's arrest based on his view that George W. Bush is a credibly accused war criminal. So this raised issues, enormous inter issues of international law, and the reality that, you know, we're living in a, in a very strange time where uh, there's not even a pretext anymore that laws are respected, uh, that it seems that there is a certain sort of criminality uh, 
open season on criminality at the highest level of our international system. And so this uh, expose on the truth of 9-11 and what did and didn't happen, of course millions and millions of people around the world, especially the Muslim world, and of course Kevin's uh, deep conviction and uh, identity as a Muslim person you know, permeates many of the issues as it did in the conference uh, yesterday. So this 9-11 uh, issue, because we didn't deal with it back then, we keep having uh, the same pattern being replicated and now we're in a series of you know, false flag events where um, people get killed, where suddenly the media is howling Muslim, Muslim terrorists, Islamic terrorists, repeating the themes that were sort of introduced to us on 9-11 <clears throat> and using the pretext of these terrorist events which are manufactured and cocked in different ways mm -hmm. uh, to justify all kinds of uh, police state measures, uh, military invasions, <clears throat> And, and so this is what we're dealing with. So Kevin's book on uh, We Are Not Charlie Hebdo, this was a, a major uh, statement, a major achievement for a 9-11 truther, one of our great 9-11 truthers, to identify an issue unfolding and to come up right away with a, an instant book, <clears throat> We Are Not Charlie Hebdo. And I'm proud of my little article in the book, uh, Witch Hunt on Terrorism. And, Kevin is it's actually a pretty big article. <clears throat> yeah, Kevin, and, and, and of course it first appeared on Veterans Today, and, and so we collaborate at Veterans Today. And Kevin is on the verge of coming up with a second book, which should be out sometime in January, uh, on this more recent Paris event. And of course, following Paris, we had the event at San Bernardino. And uh, so, so it's just like a plague. and, and of, of, of these events and you know I've, I've been very involved in, in what happened in Ottawa on October the 14th on October 22nd 2014 when a shooter by the name of Zahaf Bibo uh, went off uh, a soldier was killed uh, you know, I, I don't take anything at face value I don't really know what happened but it, it's, it's got all the uh, hallmarks of a false flag event uh, a concocted event so um, I want to just acknowledge uh, Kevin's role in all this. Not only have we worked together with Splitting the Sky, but my former graduate student, Josh Blakeney. It was Kevin who brought Josh on to his show, and Josh has become quite a, a media um, dynamo in, in his own right. So I have a very personal attachment to Dr. Barrett, uh, and we worked together, uh, I think, rather constructively uh, in, in many ways and I often have Kevin as I did splitting the sky to speak to my students through Skype and uh, splitting the sky used to come in live uh, to my students at the University of Lethbridge. So I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm proud and pleased to uh, be able to contribute to the 9-11 truth movement as a full professor, you know, engaged in teaching at the University of Lethbridge and you know when I do my reports and such, I, I I proudly refer to my articles in Veterans Today or broadcasts such such as this. And I think I've uh, I'm in an environment where the deans and the people around me, the colleagues in other departments, uh, students have come to accept that this is you know in my little circle a, a legitimate part of the discourse. And I have to say that. Yesterday at the conference, you know, this was about as far as you could expect uh, professional academics to go, and they're very solid uh, academics at, at this conference dealing with the question of Islamophobia and, uh, you know, dealing with the deep role of government officials, of different uh, lobby groups, especially Zionist lobby groups. Uh, dealing with, you know, following the money, dealing with how media is uh, mobilized uh, to uh, spread ha hatred and generate hatred towards Muslims. Uh, one of the big points that people were trying to make again and again it's, is that Islamophobia should be understood as 
um, racism, uh, although it refers to a religion and not to a, 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 you know, a colored identifiable, uh, identifiable racial group, it does constitute racism, which is fine and good. But you could really see that they, they come up to a certain point, and this was consistent across the presentations from experts in various fields. Uh, you know, it seems to me kind of a no-brainer, the underlying thesis that we're going uh, forward on is, of course, Islamophobia is being purposely generated, that these false flag events are concocted with the express uh, objective of creating hatred towards Muslims, that the military-industrial complex and all the businesses and corporations involved, they need an enemy that the enemy of the Soviets, of the communists, kind of, um, disappeared, went defunct uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and a new enemy was needed, and that Muslims globally, the Oma, were kind of chosen as uh, the new enemy on a, on a transnational basis. You needed a global enemy. And, of course, who would benefit from this? Well, of course, Israel, with its... Uh, unstable and sometimes antagonistic relations, to put it mildly, with its neighbors and with the indigenous peoples on the territory that it's created upon, on the land of the Palestinians, that uh, the global war on terror essentially provided uh, the machinery to make the local enemies of Israel especially the Palestinians, who are largely Muslim and Arab, that uh, it, it presented the pretext to uh, publicize and uh, create an image of, of Arab people and Muslim people more generally as, as the enemies of the entire West. And the West was sort of engineered and presented as if it is a Judeo-Christian construct with Islam as a kind of aberration, as a kind of new imposition, as a kind of contaminating influence. And so, you know, this building on the clash of civilizations, uh, Huntington's uh, thesis, you know, which goes back to Bernard Lewis. I mean, this, you can, you can see this was constructed that uh, Netanyahu had a big part uh, going back to the conference in Jerusalem in 1979 and laying out the sort of framework for the global war on terror and specifically how to demonize Muslims and sort of uh, develop the relationship with the United States where, well, you know, we'll provide you with an enemy to keep your businesses going, to keep your military industrial complex going so you can maintain the hierarchy that you built up over the Cold War, the same sort of structure of you know who 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 benefits most from the military industrial complex mm -hmm. that was able to be maintained by 9/11 and what followed. Now, wasn't it interesting how at the Jerusalem Conference for International Terrorism in 1979 they were able to segue from terrorism as a universal threat, but primarily linked to the Soviet Union, because that's how it was presented by the majority of the contributors to that conference and the volume that came out as a book edited by Netanyahu. It's, uh, it, it's, it's called Terror, or Terror, uh, yeah, Terrorism, How the West Can Win. And in that book, Netanyahu collects these essays, and sort of half of them point at this evil, the evil terrorists are all somehow linked to the Soviet Union. But in others, we start to get a hint that the real terrorists that he has in mind are the evil Muslims who are a threat to Israel. They never come out and say it. The key essay in that book for people to go back and look at is the contribution by Bernard Lewis, the mm -hmm. Dean of Orientalist Studies. He's a British uh, Jew and an ardent Zionist. And in his contribution uh, to that volume edited by Netanyahu, it's called, uh, if I recall, uh, Islamic Terrorism? Question <laughs> mark. And he's essentially writing a classic neocon article in which he tells the, you know, gives the, ma the masses sort of pablum on the surface. He, said, you know, he asks about Islamic terrorism, and he says, well, you know, Muslims really don't have any particular propensity for terrorism. Beneath the surface, however, he's referring to the Ismaili assassins. He's done his dissertation on that subject, and he knows that from his perspective, the Ismaili assassins undermined 
the authority of the governing structures of the Middle East in order to, well, one of the effects they had, that had was to allow the Crusaders to penetrate into the Middle East and to take Palestine. So what he's saying between the lines for his fellow neocons, because neocons believe that you can't tell the truth directly, they, they're happy Socrates was executed for telling the truth, they believe that you have to speak between the lines to your fellow neocons. And so what they're saying is Islamic terrorism, question mark, that is, as the title of the book by Netanyahu calls it, how the West can win, that is by creating Islamic terrorism, quote unquote. That's what that book is proposing in 1979. We need to create Islamic terrorism that does not exist in and of itself because Muslims have no propensity for terrorism, as he admits, as Lewis admits. But we have to create this false flag, Islamic terrorism, so that the West can win. And of course, it's really Israel that he wants to win. Yes. So all of this is by way of uh, introduction, and I see this uh, conference as a real marker, as a major moment in uh, Dr. Barrett's history. Uh, so we want to thank you for the book, uh, We Are Not Charlie Hebdo, and uh, to uh, take into account uh, the enormous amount of work and uh, uh, your networking with people uh, around the world. Uh, and your ability to be able to come up with a, an academic work. I mean, I, I'm seeing our conference right here, right now in Paris as a kind of a indicator of the kind of discussion that should be happening among intellectuals, that should be happening in the academy, but is not. And we could see yesterday that, that, that is, it is not. So uh, to, to include... Uh, you, the audience, in, in a recognition of Dr. Barrett's uh, work. And here we are in the city of enlightenment, the city of the French Revolution, the city uh, that in the 1700s was a sort of recognized as the great center of uh, you know, a huge amount of intellectual discourse, high-level discourse that eventually led to a, a major reworking of the whole way that people are governed and imagine their governments uh, uh, this is the city where uh, Benjamin Franklin and others came and more or less planned the Civil War in the British North America that is now remembered as the American Revolution. This is, you know, it was the French backing of a monarchy who, who backed uh, those supposedly fighting monarchy who founded the United States. It happened in this city. So, you know, here we are. And, and this, now it's under martial law, Tony. And here we are in this city We're, under martial law yeah. where this false flag event has been uh, played and manipulated, where the Assembly Nationale voted unanimously to create a, a martial law uh, moment, a, 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 a regime of emergency measures, which may well not be removed. Uh, you know, income tax was brought in that way. That this uh, so-called global war on terror is becoming a menace and a plague to humanity on an enormous scale, that the rights and liberties that you know, were fought for and people died for, you know, it's not like a perfect system, it's not like people really achieved you know, the full potential of human liberation, but th some things were achieved. And, and so here in Paris, the fact that we've seen these double events where you know the city of light becomes you know well we're we're going to celebrate freedom of expression, and freedom of expression is to be identified with Charlie Hebdo, where you blaspheme and take you know in vain the the name and image of the prophet. And uh, Dudanier, for instance, uh, who speaks often in a comic way about Zionism and you know how we have to adhere to certain ideas about, about the Holocaust and such. You know, he makes jokes about this and is now, uh, you know, sent to prison. You see, he's sentenced uh, to three months in prison in the wake of this latest attack, just like yeah. he, he was prosecuted uh, for tweeting a joke in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo event. Now, right after this Friday the 13th event, he's been sentenced to three months in prison. So, so I can't, you know, overstate how I, important this is, and, and it's really you, Kevin, who, whose work has you know, led you to the point where we can meet here in Paris at this crucial juncture in the unfolding history of humanity in such an important place. 
And you know, it seems strange that uh, you would think that there would be a, a mass of massive discussion among intellectuals about how serious this is, mm -hmm. what's at play here. But it comes down to the 9/11 truthers. I mean, and isn't it interesting that this word "truther" mm -hmm. that so much about the French Enlightenment had to, to do with saying, well, how do we identify truth? Are we going to you know, stick with the church's way of identifying sacred texts and such? Or are we going to use our rationality and our reason? I'm talking about a Christian heritage, Muslim heritage, very yeah. different. Uh, and, and so, you know, to, to be a truther was used as a kind of term of insult, I suppose. It was sort of put upon us rather than we invented this. But to, to uh, deal with, you know, this false flag terrorism and the way that it is being used to poison minds and contaminate the mental environment against Muslims, that this is, you know, the, the core of a, of a much larger question that how did we let the identification of truth slip away? How do we let our media networks you know, the mainstream media just lie to us. And, and how did the French do that? Because, you, you know, I always have thought of French people as a little more educated, that their public education system here works a little better than ours does in the U.S. Uh, but, you know, I, I've been thinking about why Paris was chosen for these false flags. And I think it comes down to a number of issues. You know, of course, there's the fact that France has the biggest Muslim population in Europe. Uh, it's partly uh, also that France is the capital of the Enlightenment. It's the capital of uh, humanism. It's the capital of this philosophy that has largely replaced traditional religion. And as Emmanuel Todd uh, says in his new book, uh, Qui est Charlie? Who's Charlie? Uh, he, he says that actually what's, what we're seeing here in France is that the French dominance, the state religion for the last 200 years has been hardcore secularism that defines itself by rejecting religion. Now, what religion do they reject? Catholicism. There's always been that Catholic minority that could be the, the foil for secularism as a state religion. But now, as Emmanuel Todd says, it's gone. Nobody goes to church anymore. Catholicism is essentially defunct. There's an army of zombie Catholics with an authoritarian bent uh, for cultural reasons he explores in his book, that has become the backbone of a very authoritarian, hierarchical, and sort of unequal new dispensation here in France. Uh, so I, I think that one of the reasons that they chose Paris for these two huge false flags this year, the Charlie Hebdo false flag event, and then this latest Friday, the 13th false flag event, was uh, to strike a blow against Islam to stir up this strategy of tension, this clash of civilizations by doing it right here where the people have this ingrained mental habit of needing a religion to bash. They can't define their state religion of secularism unless they have a religion to bash. There's no more Catholicism. Oh boy, look at Muslims. They're still religious. And look at those terrible Muslims. They're so different from, you know, from what secularist ideals are. So they create this artificial difference, exaggerate it tremendously, use Muslims as a scapegoat, and that works very well here in France. The example of the Enlightenment, where we're supposed to be able to think freely and try to get to the truth. It's, it's tragic. And it works very well, unfortunately, in mm -hmm. Quebec, at least. Uh, in the last Canadian election, there was a, an election based essentially on Islamophobia. And uh, the symbol of the niqab, which is the, you know the veil which women wear. I mean, it, technically, Harper came up, the prime minister came up with a plan that uh, we can't have this veil in citizenship ceremonies. But obviously, there was an agenda at play. Mm -hmm. Linton Crosby came in from Australia, where they bash immigrants, where they bash Aborigines, uh, and uh, and. Uh, you know, using Islamophobia, the incitement of hatred towards Muslims, and then the ex political exploitation of that, that was very much present in the Canadian election. And the fact that Quebec has rejected Roman Catholicism on a big scale, that any symbol, religious symbol in the sort of public forum in the, uh, uh, you know, government's realm is, is seen as inappropriate. Uh, and, and in the United States, of course, uh, you have Trump now sort of forcing the issue of Islamophobia with his statement that we've got to just cut off any uh, back and forth across the border between the Muslim world and the United States, as if the United States isn't part of the Muslim world, which of course it is. Uh, 
so so this issue is so important and here we are in France which has this relationship with the United States you know it is the kind of initial backer of the revolutionaries the sort of people who would want to be seen as kind of freedom fighters who took up arms you know if they hadn't succeeded they might be you know considered terrorists but you know the fact that people do take up arms to achieve political objectives this has happened in history the United States above all should know so I, I look at the United States, you know, I have a soft spot in my heart for the United States. I grew up in Canada. We've got all the American television. And I see you, Kevin, I see you as a kind of symbol of, let me use the term, American chutzpah. Uh, you know, the... the, the, the and I don't know there's a that, translation of that uh, word in most languages. <laughs> the America that uh, we, you know, have thought about fondly. We've thought about, you know, the... the, the the ingenuity of Americans and, and the tremendous creativity and inventiveness of Americans. Are you, you're saying like if I'm not disinvited to a conference that I then just create my own conference? So here we are. We're, we're creating our, our conference, but really I see this event uh, uh, also as a kind of a, a major landmark in your particular career, and you are a leader in the 9-11 Truth Movement, and of course as the 9-11 event you know, goes farther and farther back in history, new situations come up and you are always responding to the latest developments, but rooted in this reality that we didn't deal with what happened on 9-11 and that makes us vulnerable for replay after replay. And you know, the, the need to have tenacity and the need to have patience and the need just to go on in spite of the fact that, the, that it's just coming at us so fast and furious now and it, there does seem to be a determination to, to just destabilize and uh, you know de like the, the millions of migrants from uh, the Middle East I mean is this a continuation of the NABCA you know creating the ground for the greater Israel to depopulate the, the the regions on, t on the eastern frontiers of Israel to send this population into Europe, which will destabilize Europe to, to some extent. Is that part of the of a plan here? Uh, so well, yeah, they, they told us they were going to have a war that would not end in our lifetimes. That's, that's precisely what Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld said after 9-11. It's a new 100 years war. It will not end in our lifetimes. So this is the, you know, they're planning for a permanent state of war, like something out of George Orwell, and obviously they're primarily demonizing Muslims to create an excuse for the rollback of freedom and for this Orwellian state of perpetual war. Yes, so here we are in Paris. I must say I was surprised coming into the country yesterday. No questions at the border. It seemed the border was, uh, you know, very much uh, open and... Uh, uh, so it's strange how you have, you know, this buildup of uh, all this publicity and then leading up to, you know, the event happens, the false flag event happens, and then the legislature gets together, and then they change the laws, and they put in place uh, these draconian measures, and then suddenly just back away. And nothing's well, changed. yeah, it looks nothing normal, happens. except for all those yeah. people in the streets of Paris with assault weapons. You know, yeah. that when I came here to live for a year in 1988 and 1989, there was nobody walking around the streets with assault weapons. Um, that reminded me of Guatemala. At the time, I'd been to Guatemala, and seeing all these thugs walking around in Guatemala City with their assault weapons in the wake of a genocide, you know, that was Guatemala. That was not Paris. But now, Paris looks like Guatemala. Everywhere you go, there are these guys with the assault weapons. I mean, that's the big visible difference to me. Yeah, uh, and it's like these emergency powers are there, as if they're being, you know, the, the, the system has changed, but I'm, I'm suggesting there's, it's, it's almost a ploy to do the dirty work, then to pull back and make it look like nothing's happened. Yeah, it's, it's and oiling people, the fraud. Yeah, and, and so people yeah. say, oh, you know, I, we heard the sky was going to fall, fall in, and then two weeks go by and the sky is still there, and mm -hmm. you say, well, I guess it... Oh, let's just get used to it. it. Let's get used to having the streets of Paris full of people with assault weapons. Yeah, that's, yeah. Not, that's pretty much how it works. Hey, I think we have our first conference participant just about ready to participate. So uh, I'm not quite sure how we know when he's on camera, but I think that we will... Uh, learn about that very soon. Should we go ahead and, and talk a little bit about him? Yes, I can see James Tracy, Professor Tracy. Hello. Hello there. How are you? Hey, welcome, Jim. How are you? Fine, thanks. Let's, Greetings. Let's from introduction. 
<laughs> this is Professor James Tracy, <laughs> and we are going to admit that he is from Florida Atlantic University. Um, there may be people in that corner of Florida who aren't all that enthusiastic about us saying that, but I think Professor Tracy is a credit to his university. He has stood up for the truth as he sees it and offered a very well supported critical analyses of extremely controversial issues. He runs the Memory Hole blog, which is one of the most important internet sites available today. Uh, he teaches communication and he puts his money where his mouth is by critically analyzing the kinds of communications and especially mass communications that are shaping our world today for better or usually for worse. Um, so <laughs> Professor Tracy is, is going to give us a, a talk. I'm not quite sure how long and then we can entertain some comments and questions. Uh, say, take it away, James Tracy. Okay, great. Well, thank you for those uh, kind remarks, Kevin. And uh, hello, uh, uh, Professor. Um, I wanted to, you know, I was listening to your remarks concerning, um, you know, the state of, uh, of, of the world, of, of Europe, of the Middle East over the past half hour and uh, trying to plug it in to what uh, I'll be discussing. And one of the things that was especially um, significant uh, is uh, the this new religion called secularism. And Kevin, you and I have talked about this, for example, on your show, and you uh, discuss its ascendance in uh, France specifically. And I think something that is really part and parcel to this, this new secularism, this new form of religion, is journalism, uh, is the acceptance of journalism without questioning it, uh, it is something that embodies the notions of objectivity, and uh, it is through that prism of modern journalism, with all its faults, that we see these false flag events, these bombings, these shootings, uh, and 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 there is this reverence toward the institution, at least among a certain segment of the population, uh, and uh, you know they do in many ways hold the reins of communication. You know, CNN, granted, do not have the higher, highest viewership any longer, nor MSNBC, but as far as hits on the web, they are deferred to and they are news gathering sources. So this is what uh, I'm focusing on in part in the contribution to uh, Kevin's forthcoming edited volume. Uh, and the professionalization of journalism began in the early 1920s, uh, back in, specifically in 1922, the American Society of Newspaper Editors Canons of Journalism declared that good faith with the readers is the foundation of good journalism. Every effort must be made to assure that the news content is accurate, free from bias and in context, and that all sides, sides are presented fairly. And now this sort of ethos is echoed throughout all of the standards and guidelines of major news organizations. That sources, your, your news itself is only as good as your source or your set of sources. And if reporters cannot be there in person to witness an event, they have to have a decent source in order to be able to explain that event in a valid way, in a way that is credible. So it's, in fact, Reuters, their guidelines specifically state that they must have good sources. And of course, these have to be on the record or else they have to be like court documents or something else that is publicly accessible in order to avoid the reliance of hoaxes in order to 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 you know avoid this this possibility which i think is uh is ve a very significant uh, observation this is from their i believe from their from their guidelines so based on that you know overall uh foundation i looked at a variety of news coverage of the paris 1113 attacks and um it's very interesting that a majority of the sources, aside from the government, uh, you know, officials are the ones which are frequently 
uh, deferred to, and uh, Hollande was the uh, foremost official in this regard, actually being there at the soccer match, his life being threatened and declaring the state of emergency. Most of the other people on the ground have ties to media or public relations industries. Now this is according to their uh, LinkedIn pages or their profiles uh, uh, online. Uh, in some cases this is stated specifically in the articles where they're quoted. In other cases it's much more oblique. The other sources who are quoted you know, on the scene are people with their first names. They're not, they, they haven't used their full names, they don't have any sort of affiliation or anything alike, and so their testimony is also somewhat questionable. But, you know, the official sources and these, the sources that are tied to the various media, entertainment, public relations industries, and the anonymous sources are the ones that shape our understanding and overall public opinion concerning the Paris 1113 attacks. I can remember, uh, what was it, it was uh, a month ago now or three weeks ago, uh, uh, you know, pointing out the front pages to my wife on Saturday morning and saying, you know, there is no evidence based upon these pictures or this testimony of, of, of something with the gravity that was claimed to have taken place as actually having taken place. So we have the semblance of terror. Uh, without any real substance. And if you, you know, we are um, a society that is to a large degree governed by imagery rather than, you know, substance and information. And this is, this is a real uh, concern uh, when people don't actually dig down and uh, look more closely at the sources. Especially so if the journalists are not doing this, right? Uh, they're they're the supposed to be our eyes and ears and supposed to be vetting uh, all of this uh, coverage. And ideally they should be revisiting it as well because as we've learned from London 7-7, 9-11, uh, Oklahoma City, uh, it is the historian that might go back and look at these or you know the independent author to analyze these events more critically but the journalistic institutions seldom actually do and I think this also is to a significant degree their responsibility. This has been left to the alternative media uh, and fortunately we do have alternative media via the internet now. Uh, how long that's going to last is uh, questionable. The fact that it is now under fire in France, uh, the French government is referring to it as conspiracy theory. Uh, and thus seeking to censorship, uh, censor the, the, the information. Even this conference uh, is uh, under the threat of possible censorship, as uh, Dr. Barrett has, has uh, pointed out to the, to the participants. So, Professor, Professor Tracy, could I, uh, just before uh, I, I can see your poise to go on the next subject? Sure. Um, well, I, yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, it does occur to me that you know we, we, we have this image of the mainstream media and the alternative media, but let's just break it down a little bit more because in the United States, of course, the uh, media companies dominate and it's pretty much been given over the public airwaves uh, and newspaper ownership has pretty much been given over to the private sector. Uh, in uh, Canada, where we kind of replicate Great Britain on some levels, we have a, a public broadcasting corporation, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which in theory is not, you know, profit motive and, and is accountable to the people. And so there is a BBC and so there is an, an Australian broadcasting company. And what is really uh, striking to me is that these public broadcasters whose whole mandate is not to make a profit at least they weren't set up on that understanding, but it's to, you know, give all points of view in the society an opportunity to be heard, uh, to, uh, you know, elevate the discourse in, in, in the society that even these public broadcasters, the CBC, the BBC, go along with these, this agenda which is invented by, you know, public relations experts, uh, you know, the, the children of Edward Bernays, the, you know, the original PSYOP with, uh, at least in this round, you know, in, in selling the people a, 
a view that the uh, U.S.-backed coup in Guatemala was in fact an indigenous uprising of you know freedom fighters trying to protect their country against communism. You know, this became a kind of uh, the prototype in the Cold War, and you had this enormous growth. And you had Project Mockingbird, you know, where the CIA hires thousands of, of journalists. Um, so, so the fact that you know we have the the business of the media, the profit-making sector, acting this way, but then we have you know these public broadcasters also replicating this, and then then we have the alternative media where there's a lot of gatekeeping taking place and a lot of uh, a subversion. Uh, so, so I just thought, you know, as we sort of introduce this idea of PR people and people with contacts in these big media conglomerates, that there is, you know, a very, very definite government aspect. And, of course, government is supposed to regulate and authorize everything that's broadcast, that even the private sector broadcasts are supposed to be, yeah, yeah, go go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, so so we're yeah. I, uh, Kevin's let, let, you got to get let, let Tony pick trying, it up. <laughs> Kevin's trying to give me a subtle hint. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pointing, pointing at the clock. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, that that's where I uh, I'll leave it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think uh, Tony, I think those are totally very good points. Very good points. And um, you um, do have institutions, yeah, governmental institutions, institutions, uh, institutions uh, uh, as as well as philanthropic foundation. Foundation. That, that say in the United, the United States, States and the West more broadly, more broadly uh, the, the progressive left, left alternative media are especially are sensitive to because, because their uh, reliance uh, on funding on from funding these foundations. From foundations. Uh, so, you know, so, a few years, know, years ago, one expected to, one possibly, expected to possibly see possibly some critical, critical reform on situations uh, situation, in Libya. Yeah. In Syria, yeah, Syria uh, by the likes uh, of democracy likes now, of democracy. Uh, but it was, uh, but it was very, differed very little, very little from um, uh, national public radio, national public radio. Right? Uh, or what we saw uh, on uh, uh, outlets. Uh, and, outlets. And, and we could then and go on about that for some time. But I think that there's a, a similar there's type a similar of sensorial dynamic, dynamic taking place uh, with uh, the likes of the BBC. Uh, the CBC, uh, the CBC uh, ABC, ABC in Australia, which uh, I also do uh, in this in this, paper, in this, in this uh, citations, citations from, from, from the coverage, coverage of the Paris attacks. Attacks. So, so um, there are there. Uh, uh, Kevin, do you have anything to add? No, I was just going to try. Yeah, I was going to try to tell uh, Alan at uh, at Nolas Radio. That we we okay we we can't avoid the feedback issue because we can't set up two sets of headphones. Um, sure. But, uh, sure. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, to talk a little bit more, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, you, you were mentioning the we were relying, relying on, on these particular kinds of reports from, from the stadium, stadium, stadium sites, other sites of, of the, the massacre in Paris, Paris, thirteenth of November. And the, my question would be, my question would be, with the rise of social media, theoretically, we should be seeing uh, huge numbers of social media tweets and Facebook posts and so on from people who actually were at those events. And it should be possible to sort of collate those. Is there a way to do that? Well, we've hardly seen any of that uh, of, of that imagery. Uh, we've hardly uh, seen uh, any videos or photographs uh, that we would expect to see. And you know, this is something that, uh, to a a large degree, degree is replicated in other types of uh, of events along these lines. Mass shootings is, you know, uh, pretty much everyone above the age of uh, 12 or 14 has an iPhone now. Uh, I don't, but uh, most everyone does uh, in the West, and you would therefore expect to uh, see a great deal of of uh, imagery emanating from these events. But that, in fact, uh, is not the case. In fact, it's restricted, curiously restricted, to a handful of videos and photographs and testimony uh, from a select number of individuals that, as I mentioned at the outset, once again, uh, are frequently affiliated with uh, the public relations or marketing or media industries. 
uh, or they uh, are anonymous. Yeah, and so it's kind of a paradox, isn't it, that we're living in an era of decentralized media with a big critical alternative media, with all of this social media, with people able to instantly email and call on their cell phones and take pictures with their cell phones. You would really think that these kinds of events would be the most documented events in history, wouldn't you? And when it's when they're not, when there are these kinds of uh, questions that persist, uh, it, you you have to sort of scratch your head and ask what's really going on here. I think that should be one of the overarching questions uh, concerning the coverage and analysis of Paris 1113, and I've suggested that about other events as well. You know, the Boston Marathon bombing, and uh, you know, many of these these mass shootings. Of course, the foremost being Sandy Hook, but. Um, I trust that both of you are aware that there was a drill that took place uh, in Paris beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. on the 13th of November. And um, this, in fact, is something that was um, discussed on French television by Pierre Carly, who is the director of the Anesthesia Intensive Care Department at the Hôpital Necar Infant. Uh, Malades of Paris and the medical doctor of uh, medical emergency services of Paris. And he discussed in two separate interviews, once again on French TV, uh, how uh, it all began at 10 o'clock a.m. with, and now I'm quoting, all eight uh, medical emergency services. We had an exercise with computers, phone calls, lists of victims, all the elements we need to dispatch the victims to hospitals and dispatch our forces to sites as they became known. The drill helped everyone enormously. We were right there, ready, and it's something we'd done several times practicing for treating victims with gunshot wounds, which requires special treatment, you understand. And that particular day, we had the organizational part, meaning based on the victim analysis, how many and where they were, get them to hospitals and better coordinate amongst ourselves, doctors, firemen, police, to perform like that. So once again, at 10 a.m., it's an unannounced exercise. And um, you know, this, I think, is kind of the smoking gun. Uh, and it's interesting, I did a LexisNexis search, and Carly's name only comes up once. And he's mentioned really in kind of a, you know, a remark, I believe, that was quoted in the UK Guardian, uh, really in the last few paragraphs of a story. But otherwise, there's no discussion of how this um, uh, this drill took place specifically by him. But the spokesperson for him, curiously, is a Patrick Pellew, uh, who I'm sure that uh, you are likely familiar with, Kevin, since you edited the uh, uh, the book We Are Not Charlie Hebdo. Uh, and um, he, in many ways, now Pelu is a professional actor. He's a personal friend of Francois Hollande, and um, he was at the Charlie Hebdo attacks. He was one of the first responders. Now it's very difficult to confirm uh, Pelu's uh, medical credentials, but he is apparently the head of a union that represents emergency workers uh, in Paris. He's also starred in two films, Incognito in 2009 and Bad Girl in 2012, and he wrote a medical column at the Charlie Hebdo Humor magazine. So, of course, he was there on the 7th of January oh. of, of 2015. And um, he is, the, in, in many ways, uh, the person that major media uh, defer to uh, in order to, to uh, explain that a drill, in fact, took place, coincidentally, on the morning of 11-13. Uh, of, of and uh, now, he hardly really talks about what he is allegedly a doctor in, which is uh, medicine. He, he hardly talks about the uh, the you know the care of the injured. He's primarily talking in bellicose uh, uh, sort of a, a bellicose language about how the, uh, the 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 French were attacked, and uh, there was uh, we must respond, uh, and and really kind of uh, providing I think uh, the the basis for 
uh, you know, the, uh, the, the France's uh, intervention in uh, in Syria specifically. I'm looking for a uh, for a, a quote here. Um, in my uh, in in my notes, isn't that strange though? A medical doctor running the drills, friend of Hollande, uh, involved with the Charlie Hebdo affair, uh, and in the in Charlie Hebdo, the magazine. I mean, this guy gets around. Yes, exactly. Uh, he says um, he says on um, the reaction to eleven thirteen should be European. We mustn't be afraid. We must all stand together to find a Churchill spirit. A Churchill spirit. Pelou, who wrote the column uh, on the medical world for Charlie Hebdo, this is a UK Guardian article now I'm quoting from, was one of the first at the scene of the massacre at the Satirical Weekly. Coincidental, of course. He gave his colleagues emergency treatment as many of his friends lay dead after two French gunmen opened fire with Kalashnikovs killing 12 people. Ten months later on Friday night, Pelou was in a Paris... Uh, A&E department uh, treating some of those seriously injured in the latest series of coordinated attacks that left at least 129 people dead and hundreds injured. Uh, and uh, he says uh, as well as, as and, and, and interestingly and also of course coincidentally uh, Pelou's book on the Charlie Hebdo attacks was published on November 12th. Uh, he states, uh, that morning the emergency services in Paris had actually done a training exercise for a major terrorist attack. We were well prepared, but the type of attack uh, of the attack is significant. It is a methodical gunning down of everyone, a little like a video game. Um, some of the attackers appeared to have been very young, he added. The question that now has to be asked is why do these people who are so young take up arms and fight. So, you know, he's he's way out of uh, his uh, his league. This is really way above his pay grade in terms of offering political analysis about the attacks or, or, or anything of the like. Yeah, yeah go ahead, yeah. Tony. Yes, uh, Professor Tracy. Um, so, so we focus a lot, and you focus professionally on on media coverage of these events. Uh, but of course, you and I, uh, we work in universities, and uh, a big subject that we're dealing with uh, t today in this, or this evening in this conference, is uh, uh, the academy. And uh, uh, so we point fingers at the media and the failures of the media, uh, but there's been an enormous failure of the academy to deal with what happened on 9-11 and all the subsequent rounds of false flag terrorism and in a way I think the media has uh, you know taken uh, quite a bit of criticism from uh, the alternative quarter but the Academy I think has been uh, not criticized enough that our colleagues have been kind of given a pass uh, and obviously you know it's not a good career move for a young journalist to deal with these issues it's not a good career move uh, for uh, professors to step up to the plate. Um, and I think you yourself have experienced some uh, persecution, uh, some violation of, you know, we're, we're, when we go into this line of work, we're, we're encouraged to think that this is about uh, being able to uh, get the tools to identify truth, to identify falsehood, to uh, speak truth to power, even if it's uh, difficult uh, and inexpedient to do so. That this, These are the values that we sort of thought we were uh, being uh, invited into. Uh, and, and, and when it comes to th these issues, though, there seems to be a huge breakdown of the academy, and the academy is losing credibility, just like the mainstream media is losing credibility. And I know you can address some of those issues from personal experience. Could you help us with that? Absolutely. Well, uh, as you know, uh, Professor Hall, uh, our institutions are largely dependent on and sensitive to uh, donors. And they are, in, in many ways, it's like working for a corporation. So the content of what we say and the content of our work becomes more significant and it becomes more of a target than the validity of it and the substance of it, the weight of it. 
And I think that is a real problem. And you're right, it's the same with, with well, almost the same with journalists, although I think it's probably more severe because journalists don't have tenure. Uh, at least we do have that safeguard, although I think tenure is to a large degree superfluous today uh, for many. It, it's something that um, is, um, it is there to, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a, um, a right for us uh, to be able to have due process. Uh, but um, I don't really think that it is utilized to the extent that it actually could be or should be. Now, we're having this conference because uh, Dr. Barrett was <laughs> excluded uh, from the, uh, you know, the, the formal academic conference where false flag terror cannot even be broached. And I think that if you can't talk about false flag terror when you're talking about Islamophobia, it's like trying to talk about 9-11 without talking about Philip Zelikow or without talking about the project for a new American century or the 1979 conference that uh, the both of you discussed uh, that was uh, that was presided over by Benjamin Netanyahu uh, from which a, a book was edited uh, that really provided the overall framework for the war on terror. So we're looking at Islamophobia with huge blinders on uh, in, in academe to a large degree and I would say also in terrorism studies and that's tremendously unfortunate and it's something that I think hopefully uh, you know events like this uh, and uh, and the work that uh, that we're producing will challenge that and, and will change the uh, change the scene. I think also uh, the notion of false flag terror is something that calls into question the ideal of an open society or democracy and all of these things even though I think they are to a large degree illusory are the kinds of, of, of the stuff of myths that I think that our colleagues generally sort of espouse and believe that they are upholding uh, so that's again why I think we're here well, thank you uh, very much, James Tracy, uh, communications professor, and all around uh, courageous voice of truth. Um, it's screaming in the wilderness, but there are more and more of us. Uh, so I appreciate your fantastic work uh, and your courage. Uh, keep it up, and I look forward to more conversations down the line. Thank okay. you very much, Professor well, Tracy. Thank you both, and thanks, Dr. Barrett, for inviting me. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. Okay. Well, we, we have, have another guest coming up. Uh, we have Catherine Shachtum uh, coming up on, let's, on, those, let's uh, bring on the screen. And then we also uh, have, you better say your name so I don't butcher it. Gerode Kohlmann. Gerode Kohlmann. Okay. Say it again. Kohlmann. Okay, so I'll slide over so we can see Kuhlman. it. Yes. Claim the... Claim the uh, Name the Irish yes, and it's helpful. It is, yeah. That, and uh, Gorob is uh, a frequent commentator on Russia Today, and he's the Paris, you're the Paris correspondent or one of them here? Yeah, one of them, I suppose. Yeah, I tend to do, well, I, I guess they call me a lot here when stuff stuff happens. And there's a lot happening, obviously, this year, so I've been, been on a lot, I guess, you know. Yes. France is getting more and more involved in in Syria and so on. So, yeah. And you spoke very forthrightly and uh, provocatively immediately after the Friday the 13th massacre here. Um, the, I believe the reports uh, went viral, so we appreciate yeah. your courage in speaking truth to power immediately in the heat of mm. the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean the, the pressure is immense really, isn't it? I mean, once an attack happens, you always have the, 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 the initial response is shock, and everybody's shocked, and you're supposed to sort of go along with the you know, the official narrative as it starts to develop, I mean, within, usually within a few minutes, you've got some guy, some Aldis or Aulad or Abu Dis who emerges, and uh, he's the new bogeyman, and, they, you know, it's, it's always pretty much the same kind of characters. They, they come from working class areas. Uh, you will find that uh, they're usually referred to as jihadi, jihadi extremists, and then you'll find that he was out drinking the night before the attack, or mm. um, he actually never went to the mosque, he didn't pray at all, um, you know, I mean, so, you know, you, you have sort of a narrative that that, that um, starts to develop very quickly, and there's obviously huge pressure, um, you know, um, about this uh, this whole issue of false flag terrorism is something you're not supposed to talk about. Um, 
the, I was just coming in the and in the train there, and I, I was reading an article uh, in Le Monde, which I think was a, for, for a few days ago, and it was about um, uh, the Islamic State attacking schools, wanting to kill teachers. And uh, I was just kind of thinking about that because I had been thinking of two teachers that had been killed actually uh, the night of the attacks in Paris, and there were two uh, Colombian uh, te well. Um, teachers and activists, teachers and uh, union leaders in Colombia, they were killed on the 11th of, or the 13th of uh, November by um, paramilitaries, which in Colombia normally work for the state or some sort of, mm -hmm. have some connection to the state. And they were assassinated in their homes, just broke into their homes, shot them dead. It wasn't even reported in, mm -hmm. in, in the Western press. France has huge contracts with Colombia. Uh, Colombia is the number one, after Brazil, it's now the number one um, partner, trading partner for France in, in Latin America. It's got, trade has gone up about 67% in the last few years with Colombia. I've never read anything about human rights violations really about Colombia, even though it's, you know, most organizations will tell you that it's the worst country in the world for human rights violations. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, there is just same, absolute... same in the USA. We don't yeah. hear about it either yeah, because yeah. our government is in bed with those narco-traffickers. Exactly. And it just interestingly, something I was kind of thinking about was this, uh, there, there was apparently one of the so-called, one of the accused in the attacks was apparently a Syrian who had been in Colombia and had come back from Bogota, actually. And um, yeah, there seems to have been some, I read this in the Latin American press, I read this in Colombian press and a few other um, sources in Latin America. And uh, this character had gone from Bogota to Paris and had, you know, had some connection, uh, apparently, with the attacks. And interestingly, um, with Colombia, uh, the, uh, at the very start of the war in Syria, there was a Colombian connection as well, because there was uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, terrorists that was caught very early on, I think it was March 2011, he was um, uh, an American Egyptian. So he was a he was a half Egyptian, half American. He was living in Syria, and he had, he had been arrested by the authorities coming back from Israel. And his job was basically to film, to to get footage and to create uh, disinformation through the media to basically, uh, you know, um, create create montages and stuff. And he was being paid by a Colombian in Israel, just to show you the, the, the international connections you're talking right, about, like right. narco trafficking, yeah. drugs, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. international sort of mafia connections. Right. Uh, and, yeah, you know, and a lot of that does go through Israel. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And a lot of this false flag stuff is done through and branches of the deep state. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is this is the point I'm making is that, that mm -hmm. Israel again, you know, uh, is key to this because in the article I was reading where the, the so-called Islamic State are now uh, ask, you know, calling on um, the death, uh, calling for the death of teachers. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, in the article they say that um, the uh, Islamic State are um, uh, you know, writing all sorts of conspiracy theories about a Judeo-Masonic elite. You know? Oh, no. You know, so and this is in the article. You can read it yourself. They're going to um, call us ISIS. Now. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. This is, I mean, this is where obviously this is where this is going. You know. Okay, maybe we should all say it together. We don't like ISIS. Exactly, and you know, the, the ISIS are complaining about uh, you know the indoctrination in the schools by Judeo Masonic elite and so on. It's funny how ISIS seem to talk about a Judeo Masonic elite when mm -hmm. when they're threatening Europeans. Mm -hmm. But they never seem to target Israel when they're active in the Middle East. And when their fighters are being treated in Israeli hospitals, yeah, you know, that doesn't seem to be an issue. I, 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 I was wondering if they spoke the to Netanyahu about right, that, right. about the Judea Messiah. You know, Joe, we're, we're going we're to have to pick this up in a moment because uh, we're right now going to bring on a very special guest, Catherine Shaktam. She's a political analyst, writer, and commentator on the Middle East with a focus on radical movements, Yemen, and related issues. She's been published in a long list of places and been interviewed on so many places, including some that you're on as well, RT, for example, uh, and many, many others. Uh, she's the director of programs at the Shafakna Institute for Middle Eastern Studies, and she's the co-founder and director of Veritas Consulting and the author of Arabia's Rising, Under the Banner of the First Imam. So it's a welcome. Uh, let's give a big welcome to Catherine Shaktam. Assalamu alaikum, Catherine. How are you? I'm really well, thank you so much. That was, again, a great, in a great introduction, so thank you for that, Kevin. Um, yes, wonderful to have you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually, I really love the points that you made, and I'm very interested about this narrative, uh, because I think when it comes to the Paris attack, we have been very much focused on facts and trying to, you know, to prove that it was a false flag attack, and I think that you know, people will either agree with you know facts 
or they will try to, you know, put a spin on it and try to make it fit their own narrative. Uh, but I think that what we need to really look at is exactly it's where, you know, powers are trying to, you know, where they're trying to direct us to and, and the kind of direction and the rhetoric that they're having. Um, and I think that the fact that France was, um, I think, earmarked for destruction in a way um, is very telling because for me, France has become this ground zero for, you know, what I would like to call the, this kind of new world order where they want to ensure that, you know, the, this form of, you know, radical secularism will take hold. Um, and I think that France was picked because, you know, Republican values, I think, and the way that they have been eroded by the state, um, you know, made it a very fertile ground. Um, and even though, I mean, I know that the French, you know, very much like to go to this idea that, you know, France is a great republic, and it used to be once upon a time, um, and that they love this idea that, you know, the, the judicial, the executive, and the legislative are very separate from each other and very independent from one another. Um, you know, France has a long history, a very difficult tradition with this idea that the church and the state need to be separate. And so there's this fear of the religious in France that has been, I think it's almost genetic now, it's passed on in the DNA where it's, it's being, you know, I was raised in France and very early on I was taught that the only way to be French was to be Republican. Uh, and it was to look upon the religious with this kind of almost uh, fear that they could one day come back and, and basically uh, rule over the republic. Um, and so I think that this is why, you know, Muslims have been picked on so violently in France, because I think that, you know, when we look at the, at the Judeo-Christian world today, in Europe anyway, um, you know, people are Christian or even Jewish, but just by name, very often it's not something that they claim in terms of, you know, their the, the, the practice of it. They don't really feel themselves as Christian and then something else. It's very much they're French, they have, you know, they have political affiliation and then, you know, somewhere at the bottom, you know, they, they identify as Christian, but it's not something that they leave. But for Muslim, it's very different because I think that Muslim um, very much identify as Muslim first. Um, you know, this, this faith has been very, very much embedded in how they, you know, their identity, how they relate to one another, how they interact, interact with each other, um, and how they organize even, you know, the the community. And so I think that in that sense, Islam scare, you know, um, secular in that you have, you know, about 1.6 to 2 billion people who actually have critical thinking and who are able to actually put their own morals and value above everything else. Um, and so it makes them, it's very difficult to control people and brainwash people who have such strong sense um, of values. And I'm not saying that other people, other Christians or Jewish people or Buddhists for that matter don't have that, they do. But I'm saying that in the great scheme of things, and if we look at numbers, you know, Muslims have a greater sense of religious identity than other groups. Um, and I think that's the reason why they were, you know, they have been, you know, the, the designated enemy uh, for, for the past decade because Muslim bother and Muslim happen to be, um, you know, very, very many um, in a region of the world which holds many resources, which is the Middle East. Um, and so, of course, it was, you know, it was almost natural that they became the enemy of Western powers because Western powers wanted to colonize the Middle East. Um, and Muslim had an issue with that because they wanted to remain independent. So that's the first thing. Um, now, I think that what we need to look at what has happened in France since the Paris attack, because it's not so much what happened and the mourning that occurred, is what French politicians and leaders were allowed to do in the name of national security, in the name of democracy, and, you know, under the pretense that they wanted to protect their people. They don't try, if they truly wanted to protect their people, um, I would actually argue that the Paris, you know, this, this attack on Paris should never have happened. Because in this day and age, when we know that we have surveillance, you know, ultra surveillance, when we know that emails are being read, that, you know, um, conversation over the phones are being intercepted and recorded, um, I don't believe that we could have such a coordinated attack in the heart of France, in the capital, you know, without any intelligence services picking up on it. So it was either the case where it was allowed or it was engineered by certain powers um, or, you know, there was some kind of a concerted effort to make it happen so that the political would have the agenda. And the agenda, to me, 
um, is what we see today, which is now France is under a state of emergency. And what it means, it means that civil liberties have been cancelled, in essence. So the Republic is dead. As of today, the Republic in France doesn't exist anymore because French President Hollande has all the powers he needs uh, and wishes to have upon his people. And that means that people have been raided in their homes without any um, you know, over oversight from the judicial or the legislative. It means that people are being arrested in the street just because they look Muslim. And that, to me, is essentially a skin color because in France, Islam has been linked to everything which is foreign and has been linked to you know, the Arab ethnicity. So it means basically Islam has become a nationality now to be feared. And this is very dangerous because you know, we are, I'd like to go back to Hitler and how Nazism actually came to be. We often ask ourselves, how did this happen and how could we have allowed it to happen? But this is how. This is, you know, when we have people who have so ruled by fear and, and, this, and so brainwashed by this narrative that, you know, the other, the Arab, the Muslim is there to get them. Um, you know, the same type of narrative that, by the way, Israel has used for the past 60 years. Um, saying that all Palestinians are inherently bad people are there to kill Jews, uh, which is of course not true. And so people have lost any sense of reasoning um, and they're only reacting. And I think that's why exactly this is why Paris attack happened because by allowing fear to rule people, then the reason went out the window and people are just now reacting and they're not trying to, to have any type of critical thinking and say to themselves, you know, is this going to protect me? Is this going to you know, prevent another attack? Because essentially, that's what people want. They want to make sure that this does not happen again. But I'm afraid that you know, uh, fear mongering and, and bombing Syria, uh, I don't see how the two relate. And yet, this is how politicians have sold it. Because since the Paris attack, state of emergency, French people have been arrested en masse in France without any oversight. People have been raided. Property has been seized. And now they're arguing that they want to, you know, strip nationality away from people on account that they're Muslim. That's the narrative that is coming out of France. And now we have the far right, which is, you know, uh, reaching the heights of power, something that people thought would never happen in France, especially after what happened under Nazi Germany. France had um, a very nasty episode under, under Nazism because France actually collaborated with Germany. Um, and this has been a, um, a very difficult period in French history where people have, you know, suffered shame because of it. Um, and we are going back to it. So we're going back right there where we were, which is fascism. Um, and this is the narrative coming out of Paris. Yes. This is under a new Vichy regime. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, this is something that the French have tried very, very hard to forget. Um, and they have tried to, you know, to move away from it, and, and so should they. But now we, we're going back to it, and that says a lot about French society and how you know, the French never really got over you know, what, the root of fascism. You know, they, they blame fascism, saying, oh, that was Nazi Germany, that was you know, this anti-Semitism. But you know, I beg to differ. I don't think it was anti-Semitism. I think it's just you know, this, it's white supremacism. Uh, people in France are just profoundly racist and they're still living under those colonial times where they feel that white people are more entitled um, than any other people. Uh, and that means brown, black, whatever color, whatever ethnicity, as long as they don't look like them, um, you know, this is for them an issue. We talk about Islamization in France. We talk about the disappearance of French identity and French culture. But what is culture? I mean, culture, French culture, it's okay when French culture is being imposed on other people in Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, you know, Nigeria, Senegal, when we were at the time of the colony. That was okay to impose their, their French model onto other people. But when they have immigration, then it becomes a problem. But then again, they went, they, they're the one, the French government back in the 50s and 60s went to go get those people. You know, those Africans, those Arabs, you know, from the colonies to help them rebuild the country. And so you would think, you know, that they would be grateful and that there would be a place for them in society, but apparently not. Because again, you know, a few decades later, the French are now want to reclaim their white identity and they're using Paris attack as, you know, this as a cover and, and to justify and to rationalize it. And that's very dangerous because once again, we're heading towards the Holocaust. And it's not just Muslim, by the way, because... A lot of the time we talk about, you know, Muslim are being the scapegoat, of course. 
but I think it's religion in general because again in France we talk about you know this separation between the church and the state and how you know the, the French have pushed laws after laws you know denying people the right to leave their religion or to express their faith you know however they wish to and of course it has you know Muslim have felt it the most because again you know the, uh, you know Islam is a very is a very visible religion especially for women um, and so the French have targeted Muslim women, of course, with the with the headscarf and and such things. Uh, but it's not just Muslim; it's everyone, because we are denying people the freedom of religion. And Muslim are first in line, but who's next? There is no such thing as just you know targeting one people, because once they'll be done with Muslim, then they're going to move on to the next people and say, well, we don't want Christian in our country, or we don't want Jews in our country, or we don't want Buddhism in our country, because against it goes against rep republican values. Uh, and I think that's the problem. There is no Republican values. What we have is fascism. What we have is, is secular radicalism. And I would actually argue, again, that the narrative coming out of ISIL and the narrative coming out of Paris right now is identical. Um, it's just that in Paris, they know how to brand it better and you know, they have better PR and they're not calling just yet, not just yet, for mass murder. But when you hear Donald Trump in America calling for you know, uh, terrorists, families to be executed on account that it would actually make terrorists think twice before targeting American interests or European interests for that matter. Uh, we're almost there. We're almost there because who's a terrorist? Because under the definition, being Muslim is just enough for being labeled a terrorist. Or if I go by, you know, British Prime Minister David Cameron, um, I, you know, um, definition of terrorism, anyone who speaks against the government would be a terror collaborator and I'm actually quoting him that's what he said when people were arguing you know that the war in Syria was a bad idea that bombing Syria would not help make Britain safer um, and so you know I expect now coming from France the same type of narrative but what makes them so different than ISIL narrative because ISIL wants to do what they want to kill anyone who doesn't believe what they believe they want to execute anyone who doesn't identify as being one of them and this is exactly what the French are saying right now. This is exactly what Western capitals are saying. And this is exactly the type of narrative that neocons have sold for the past decade. But now it's, it's, it's almost, you know, we have reached a different speed. Things are moving very quickly. And the people are just about ready to become completely fascist and to believe whatever is coming out of the leader's mouth just because they fear that should they discuss, should they question, then they would be labeled terrorists as well. I think there's a great amount of fear going on right now in France where people don't feel safe, not only in the streets, but they don't feel safe in their heads because they have been told that if they question, then they are aligning themselves with those terrorists. And this is exactly what Nazi Germany done to the Germans. This is exactly what the Vichy regime did to the French. And this is it's exactly what we need to oppose it and, and offer you know, an alternative because you cannot answer hate by more hate. And you cannot answer violence with more violence. We need to find solutions together. And we need to be able to really reason with terror. Because this terror was created by those powers who now claim to want to fight it. And until people really wake up to this, you know, there would be Paris attack. There would be a London attack. There would be whatever attack. Um, you know, those things happen because, you know, people are allowing it to happen to some degree because they're not ready to confront the problem. Of, which is radicalism and they are becoming part of the problem because it takes two to become radicals and until people just say no to their regime it's just going to keep carrying on and Paris attack would just be ground zero for more basically. Thank you very very interesting uh, discourse and, and kind of disturbing too. Well, I think uh, Professor Hall has a comment. Yes I think it's very important to particularize the uh, same narrative in a way that we're seeing in you know many countries to look at it in its particular implications we saw a similar situation in Quebec where during the last Canadian election there was a knowledge that because Quebecois have fought the Roman Catholic Church and uh, had a quiet revolution and became very secular that the issue of niqabs would be uh, very provocative in the election campaign. But the fact is, however, in, in Canada there was a, a focus on Islamophobia. The governing party of Stephen Harper tried to mobilize those forces and run a campaign on inciting and exploiting hatred towards Muslim, kind of the ultimate neocon wedging. 
and uh, failed to do so. And uh, Justin Trudeau is now Prime Minister of Canada. Of course, he's subject to the same kind of lobbies, the Israeli lobby and whatnot. Uh, but we can also get, I think, mystify this a little bit in that uh, there's a, a very simple narrative that the mainstream media, that the academics just avoid. And the, and the, and the myth, the fable is that there is a group of Muslim people acting independently, autonomously, working among themselves, getting financing, getting organizing. All of this is a, a, a single autonomous group, and, and they are motivated exclusively by reason of you know, religious zealotry, uh, religious ideology. And it's so clear, and it's coming out in spades you know, from Putin himself and so many sources uh, sitting beside me and, and all around that, hey, we've got to look at the financing, we've got to look at the history, like there is a very well-documented history of using uh, Islamic sectarianism, you know, in Afghanistan to uh, mobilize a, a mercenary army, nominally um, uh, Islam, to overthrow the Soviet regime, that's the roots of Al-Qaeda and uh, al-Nusra and al-Daesh, the same uh, the same plot being reenacted, <clears throat> and surely we can get together and just say, come on, you can't pull this again and again, just lying to us. We saw this yesterday at the conference, that this is just an autonomous movement of fanatical people acting fully according to an ideological agenda. There's a materialist agenda. It's, it's part of our economics. It's part of the military-industrial complex. Hmm. No, I, I agree, but you know the, the problem is, I think that people refuse to see because, you know, they have been almost conditioned to just, you know, follow just one narrative and, and really it's, it's, you know, we have been sold this binary world where it's, you know, it's us versus them and, you know, they have painted Islam under this Wahhabi brush um, and they don't try to look at it and try to understand, you know, every religion, by the way, have had, you know, a bunch of radical crazies who have tried to just, you know, justify, you know, the, the hateful campaign, uh, you know, by rooting themselves into the religious, because, you know, when people, you know, think that they're fighting for God, then it makes them, you know, they, again, they just stop reason. Reason doesn't come into play, and they just, you know, they're just following, uh, because they think that they're being driven by this, you know, this grand, um, you know, this, it's, it's almost, you know, it's, it's their moral duty that they have to do, and they have to, to, to enact their religion. Uh, but people don't understand because they don't understand that ISIL, Daesh, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's actually, it's not an Islamic group at all. Uh, you know, they are Wahhabi Salafi, and Wahhabism is actually um, a religious devolution, and most cleric uh, would actually argue that they are not Muslim at all because they are standing against everything which is Islam, which is compassion, reason, and, and you know, Islam is the religion of the middle, which means that Islam inherently refuses any form of radicalism, you know, whether it is bigotry, whether it is secularism, it rejects it, and it's, it's only, um, it, it is about tolerance, you know, it's about allowing people to just, you know, live their faith however they want, um, but offering, um, you know, some kind of a, of a structure to society and allowing, you know, people to have something to build on uh, and, you know, to use as a foundation. Uh, but people, again, you know, Politicians are not interested in trying to get to the truth. What they want to do is just to, to you know, market their own agenda and try to use this as a platform to just sell their hate. Because, you know, hate sells weapons. Um, and, you know, there are powers in the world who do benefit from wars. Um, and we tend to, you know, brush this and say that, oh, it is conspiracy theories. Um, and conspiracy theories means being a crazy person. Um, and I think, again, you know, if you look at the mainstream you know, narrative, this is what they have sold to the people for many, many decades, so that it, when anyone goes against, you know, what is acceptable, uh, corporate media, um, then you are labeled as a dissident or, you know, or a cuckoo clock. Um, and, you know, people say, oh, he's crazy, so they dismiss this, they dismiss those ideas. And then people have learned to just abide by this one narrative, um, and, you know, they, they are conditioned to just think a certain way, and they are very scared to just go outside this, and they cannot even comprehend that they're being lied to, even though since 9-11 there have been so many proof that it's very difficult to play the ostrich. I mean, what is it going to take for people to really wake up? But I think that people do know what, what is happening, but I think they're very scared because if we were to admit that indeed there is, there are, you know, we are in a cage, 
um, and that now we can actually see the bars in, in, you know, in our prison cell, uh, it would mean that people would have to actually react against it. Um, and I think that they lack the courage to do so because we have been told since the cradle that we don't matter, that our voice can't change anything, that us objecting against war will not make a difference. And you can actually see this in Britain when, you know, back about 10 years ago when they had this million march against the war in Iraq. It didn't make any bit of a difference, you know, because people called on the prime minister to just not bomb Iraq at the time, but he went anyway because it was pre-planned. So, you know, democracy did not work. But people thought that it means that their voices did not matter and that together it, does, it didn't matter how many they were. Um, their numbers were not enough to kind of balance out the, po the, the, the political power. But I think it's not that. I think it just means that we don't live in a democracy and that we need to wake up to this and force politicians to become accountable because when we do, when we admit that we do have the power to change things, um, then, you know, they will be forced to enact because they cannot go to war. And again, I'm going to go back to, you know, this, this war in Syria that now, you know, England has sold to the people um, was just about, you know, it was almost, they were not going to war because the people did not buy into it. You know, the people are becoming tired in the, in the UK. It's a bit different, I think, in the rest of Europe. Um, and the, the Prime Minister had to threaten people to literally tell them that you are a terrorist if you don't agree with me because he felt that he was losing the people. And that means to me that if the people you know, were to just flatly refuse to abide by the government's narrative, then the politician will have no choice but to listen to their people because you cannot have a, a government functioning if there is no form of popular legitimacy. And I'm afraid that we have allowed them to have it because we are too cowardly. Um, because the information is out there. At this day and age with the internet, if you just, I mean, just Google, um, you can find out things, you know, and people are not stupid. They can put in two together. But it's easier to just be like everybody else. It's easier to hate the other because people are thinking, as long as it's not me, as long as the hatred is not targeted against me, and then I'm okay. It's okay. But this is exactly what happened under Nazi Germany. It was the Jews, then it was the Gypsies, then it was the Communists, then it was other people. Um, and so we need to be very careful about fascism, the way it functions, because it is almost, you know, it's a very capitalist idea uh, where, you know, capitalism, unfettered capitalism is basically cannibalism. Uh, fascism functions the same way. It's just going to keep eating the space that you give. And then when there's no space, what's going to happen? So people need to understand that, you know, it's like Israel. Israel has been very racist. It has, it has functioned and evolved and fed on racism. And now it's becoming racist against their own people. It's not just Palestinians now. You have African refugee, you have Arab Israeli, and now you have even Israeli, depending on which side of the border they were born about 100 years ago, whether they were born in Russia or Eastern Europe, or whether they were born in, you know, in, in um, you know, Algeria, Tunisia, or, or you know, Egypt, or whatever. Uh, you know, skin color now is becoming an issue in Israel. Um, and it goes to show, again, that fascism has a very, very weird and disturbing way of rationalizing, you know, ostracization, exclusion, uh, and people buy into this, this, this idea and this rhetoric, and they almost, you know, find a way to, to kind of find a logic to it, uh, even though it's not natural, and it's ridiculous. Uh, but again, I think it, it has a lot to do with fear. You know, people now believe that they don't matter, and that, you know, if they can just go with the flow and just, you know, bow their head, then, you know, the, the state will ignore them, and they will be okay. Well, uh, thank you, Catherine. You know, we, we have uh, a minute or two before we're scheduled to bring on uh, Patrick Henningsen. So just can I get a very, very brief answer to a point that was raised at the uh, conference sponsored by the University of California, Berkeley, uh, yesterday by uh, Tariq Ramadan. Tariq Ramadan is perhaps the Muslim world's most famous intellectual, at least in Europe, uh, certainly the most famous francophone intellectual. He was at the conference, and he made some interesting points. And one of them, I think he probably expressed something that would be a bit different from the way you would see it. He said we should be nuanced about the way we talk about uh, Salafi people, uh, even Wahhabi people. He, he said that these people, uh, even the ultra-literalist ones, the ones who are the most obscurantist, and frankly I think we do have a problem with obscurantism in Islam, but he said even those people, the vast majority of them, 99.999% you know, of them, are not violent, not terrorists, and that's true also for Salafis and even Wahhabis. And yet uh, there's a discourse 
coming from many people, sometimes me to a certain extent, sometimes you, that says the opposite, that there's a real problem with this tendency of Wahhabism and Salafism that's given rise to takfirism, which, mm -hmm. is, a, which is a violent ideology. So it, should we be nuanced in discussing this, as Tariq Ramadan said? Uh, um, I think I think what he means is that you know he he, he doesn't want to to basically point the fingers and and brush them under you know the this, the same brush that we being brushed on, which is you know say that you know they're all bad. Um, and I will I would say that yes, of course. I mean I'm not saying that they're all radicals, but what bothers me is the ideology itself. It's you know Wahhabism and Salafism are I would say, but that's my personal opinion, un-Islamic in that they deny both of them, both the school of thoughts are denying you know Islam tenets. And that's my problem because Islam is is uh, is pluralism, and Islam is accepting that people have different understanding of the Islamic scriptures, um, and that it's okay. It, it's not a disagreement. It's just a different way of looking at things, and that there is not one truth, but there are many truths within this one truth that we will never grasp anywhere because it is divine. Um, and so Salafism and Wahhabism bother me because they exclude, you know, everyone else, and they are, you know, they claim to have the truth. And that bothers me. But then again, it would be fine if they did not identify themselves as Muslim, but maybe as, as a different religion, and that would be okay, you know, because then they would be held responsible for what it is that they say and whatever it is that they believe in. But it bothers me that you know, 1.6 billion people, maybe 2 billion people, are being brushed under Wahhabism and Salafism just because Saudi Arabia has been able to pour its billions of dollars you know, at schools, at universities, and at mosques, trying to brainwash people, deny people you know, their, their Islamic traditions um, and, and say that, you know, if you are a Shia, if you are, you know, if you are Yazidi, if you are whatever, if you are not them, then, you know, it makes you, um, you know, basic, you, you could, you know, you could be killed and you need to be killed. That bothers me. Um, you know, but the same way I would have a problem with anyone saying that it's okay to kill Christians, Buddhists or, or, or Jews because religion does not need violence. Um, and I don't think that, you know, um, I don't think religion was given to men anyway so that they could justify violence or, or go about killing people. God doesn't need us to be his armies. You know, if he wanted to kill people, he can do it by himself, thank you very much. He doesn't need us to do it. Um, and I think that we need to learn to respect each other and, you know, and value each other for our differences. You know, but that being said, I, I think that we have a moral duty to, you know, point people towards what is dangerous. And, and, you know, the kind of ideas that could lead to, you know, a form of fascism or sectarianism. But that, that is, again, valid for any religion. And I think that we need to learn that, you know, it's not just Islam. Islam has a problem, clearly, of radicalism, but so has Christianity and Judaism and all other religions, by the way. We are the problem. God is not a problem. Religion is not a problem. Faith is not a problem. It's our understanding of it. And, and so I would say that, you know, yes, you know, up to a point, Professor Ramadan makes a point. He makes a very valid point of tolerance. But the, again, I have a problem with the Wahhabi and the Salafi, and only because they're the one preaching hate, and they're the one preaching exclusion, and that bothers me. But that bothers me anyway, you know, in politics, in, in anything, because I don't think that's any way to live. And I don't believe, um, you know, that pointing the fingers or denying anyone their truth or their belief is actually the way to go. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, that comment. And... We're going to move on now to Patrick Kennington, but I want to first, uh, I want to thank you, Catherine Schechtown, for joining us. My pleasure. And look forward to staying in touch and continuing to exchange ideas. That was very beautifully put. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have, uh, we have Patrick Henningsen lined up now. Um, Patrick Henningsen is one of our leading alternative journalists. He works at 21st Century Wire. He does appear at RT and other big-time alternative media outlets, and Patrick has specialized in digging up uh, facts and specifics about various questionable terror events of all kinds. Uh, he's got a, a rubric at 21st Century Wire that he contributes to. It's called the Daily Shooter because it seems like mass shootings are becoming a daily occurrence in the USA. Of course, the only ones we really hear a lot about are when they blame a Muslim for it, uh, and that ties into the theme of our conference. Mm -hmm. A false Flag Islamophobia Conference. So uh, let's welcome Patrick Henningsen. How are you, Patrick? Hi, Kevin. How are you doing? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound, sound very great, very good. And, and we have a, a colleague of yours uh, here. Go ahead and... Gerard, yeah. How are you doing, Patrick? I was talking to you earlier. So Patrick and myself, yeah, we already know each other. We've spoken a few times. I spoke on, uh, 
on Patrick's show. And I think I, I believe I'm on tomorrow. Where more or less. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so we'll talk again tomorrow. So uh, nice to see you, Patrick. I haven't met you, yeah, Patrick, you. but very nice to make your acquaintance right here, right now. Yeah. You too, you too. So, um, so where would you like to begin, Kevin? Well, you know, the theme of this alternative conference is false flag Islamophobia, and it's a reaction to the exclusion of any real discussion of the possible false flags that many of us believe are the primary public relations stunts and instigators of the whole so-called war on terror, which is really a war on Islam, and yet at the world's premier Islamophobia conference here in Paris, we're not allowed to talk about that. You're a journalist who left the mainstream because you don't want to be restricted. You want to be able to talk about whatever the truth appears to be to you. So you know, maybe you could give us your perspective on uh, false flag Islamophobia, false flags in general, and, and the, how journalism in the academy should start to cover this. Sure. Yeah, th this is a kind of a third rail, if you will, uh, uh, for mainstream pundits and also mainstream politicians, this is something that you know you can't talk about uh, for fear of being branded a, uh, a conspiracy theorist or a kook uh, or somebody on the lunatic fringe, as it's often referred to in the United States. So, uh, and this is a big problem. This is a fundamental problem, and, and herein lies the fundamental flaw uh, of the Western media discourse and the political discourse because you have to join those two things together you you can't talk about media without talking about how this is reflected in political discourse and i'm going to contend that i believe more than politicians more than government uh... the media is the key factor it's the single most important thing uh... in terms of forming public opinion uh... in terms of the public zeitgeist for any event for any point in history and the, you can't underestimate the power of this machine as it's been built up in the West. Uh, it's enormous, uh, it's, it's relentless, and it's very well funded and very well staffed, and it does have direct links uh, to Western governments. In the United States, I can say for a fact, uh, the mainstream media has direct links to the Pentagon. It has direct financial personnel links to uh, the White House. Uh, to various uh, major civil service institutions, back and forth. There's a revolving door between uh, defense-funded think tanks, mainstream media, uh, the Pentagon itself, defense contractors themselves. So um, this is immense. Um, you know, a lot of talk about Soviet propaganda. We've all been raised with this sort of uh, uh, di dialectic uh, from the Cold War, and that uh, only uh, communist countries run state. Uh, immense state propaganda organizations, and that's simply not true. Uh, what they ran in those days, maybe in those communist countries, is nothing, nothing compared to what is being run today uh, in the West, although it's a lot more sophisticated, uh, it's a lot more built up, and I like to call it uh, glitzy. It's, a lot, it's got a sheen to it, uh, a Hollywood sheen these days, more so than anything. Um, so you, you have to talk about the media's role, because they create what's called consensus reality. So consensus reality is what you and I and everybody believe as a consensus, the majority of people, uh, what they believe is to be true. And right now in the United States uh, and in France, and we can talk about the United Kingdom and other countries, the consensus reality around uh, events like the Paris attacks, uh, around events like 9-11, a, and a number of others I could rattle off, uh, the, the Chattanooga shooting, this past summer uh, and a number of other events. So the consensus reality is that these were Islamic terror events, that these were ISIS related. In the case of San Bernardino, it was ISIS inspired. This is a new term that's been floated out into the media. Uh, so managed, uh, inspired, not directed is the exact term that uh, the US mainstream media is putting to describe San Bernardino. Now, uh, so in the case of all these 7-7 seven, seven in London, for instance, as well, there is no forensic evidence at all, nothing, to connect uh, what is known popularly as the Islamic State of uh, Iraq and Sham, or Iraq and the Levant, whichever you refer to it. There's no forensic evidence that actually connects it to the Paris attacks, other than uh, uh, hyperbole, 
in, uh, in speculation on behalf of uh, government agencies and the media is parroting this and, and it's going in both directions and so w the consensus reality is ISIS has attacked us on our homeland ISIS has a global reach and then they go on to rattle off a list which seems to be read like a script by everybody in the US media uh, right now and politicians they read them off as follows San Bernardino Paris the Russian airplane in the Sinai Peninsula ISIS has struck the Russian airliner down in the Sinai ISIS has struck Beirut bombings in November ISIS has struck uh, and they just keep adding them one after the other okay but in each and every instance that's being named on that list that's supposed to represent the global reach of this so-called Islamic State uh, there is no actual forensic evidence uh, other than what could very well be contrived uh, at best circumstantial but even then not even enough to hold up in a criminal court of law and this is my point why is the bar so low when it comes to terrorist attacks in terms of provability or in terms of forensic investigation because you couldn't this wouldn't hold up in a normal court of law and in most cases in the United States it hasn't uh, most FBI terror investigations have failed uh, uh, without the use of confidential informants who in many cases are involved in a direct entrapment. So this is... Uh, on your point about forensics there, I'm just wondering if uh, in the Paris attacks, uh, Russia today, I think in roughly videos, they showed a video of the forensic experts and one of them was smoking a cigarette. I'm just wondering if that would have anything to do with the fact that there's no forensic evidence. Um, it's quite bizarre to see forensic experts turning up at a crime scene smoking cigarettes. It's, uh, I mean, you know, again, I, I guess maybe that's just the way the French, uh, the French investigators are. But um, look, yeah, but the point is, French thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the the point is, we can joke about that another time. But the point is, the only thing that connects the Paris attacks to Syria is a fake forged passport, which. Uh, I believe, and other people, including members of the, of the German ministry, believe was planted at the scene of the crime. So it's a fake ID. Uh, we don't actually know, in many cases, the real can really verify the identification of the so-called shooters or, or suicide bombers, whichever the case may be. And you have a fake Syrian passport conveniently planted on the scene, which draws it together, fuses the issue, fuses the event together with the migrant crisis, hence the uh, public outrage, the uproar, close the borders, we need to review the Schengen policy. And this leads really to another layer of the conversation, which is the formation of a European Union army, which is a very well documented uh, conversation which I've documented at 21st Century Wire in detail and this isn't just a one-dimensional conversation this is with uh, British government uh, French government German government Austrian government and a international euro border military force to secure the perimeter of Europe that is also documented uh, in a Coast Guard and a European CIA a European FBI and a, uh, a other sort of a federal agencies so it's all the trappings of a federal state and this I believe when you look at the problem reaction solution dialectic around something like a Paris attacks you cannot deny the speed and the rapid deployment of, of policy of military action in the immediate aftermath of this event and say that that's just a natural reaction by the state uh, y to me this would be disingenuous to and but this is what the media does so they you look at it incrementally you can see that these events provide the perfect pretext for the acceleration of uh, an agenda which is often a geopolitical agenda economic agenda and ultimately uh, really a political uh, agenda so the ISIS widget if you will is a genius tool uh, it can be uh, overlaid as a brand over any event with, regardless if there's any proof or real forensic case to be made you just overlay the ISIS brand uh, it can be through social media from tweets on Twitter Facebook posts anything can be used to basically fabricate some kind of a case that's very weak that wouldn't make it in a court of law but for some reason because it's terrorism uh, we're meant to be shock in shock and awe and not to ask any questions that you would even ask in normal jurisprudence 
So I find this to be an extraordinary time in history. Uh, so this proves to me, this is proof positive, and it should be proof to everybody that terrorism as a concept is a political construct. It is, it's not anything to do, it's hardly anything to do with reality. It's a political overlay over events. And what it does is it conceals what is really going on, where the, where the crime really is, and, and another additional proof I can support this is that the major talking point in U.S. neoconservative or right-wing media circles, including Fox and all the major talk radio uh, who have a monopoly on U.S. talk radio, which are Rush Limbaugh, Michael Savage, Glenn Beck, Mark Levine, all right-wing uh, talk radio pundits, are all saying that uh, they're, they're chastising President Obama for calling it uh, a criminal act for calling international terrorism a criminal act and they decry him I quote why won't this president call this out for what it really is radical Islam why won't he say the name why is he referring it to as a criminal activity what they're doing there is they're trying to take the conversation away from forensics away from rule of law away from jurisprudence away from the the nation-state the republic and into a politicized sphere which is completely political, okay? And what it does is it conceals what, and it, it allows the real criminals to basically walk free. It allows uh, very little in terms of real investigation, and it also it, it conceals a level of corruption that, to me, is systemic uh, through uh, intelligence agencies, which overlaps with organized crime. Gerard pointed out the narco trafficking. Uh, linked to terrorism uh, earlier, which I think is very accurate. So, but by by not calling it a criminal criminal act, it, it carves out uh, a kind of a political construct. So, it has nothing to do with religion, and nothing to do with faith or belief. Uh, what this Islamic radical Islam they're calling it's a they're creating a political construct. And what it what are we really dealing with? We're dealing with a cult uh, in the terms of Islamic State, for instance, it's a cult. It's being bankrolled by clandestine uh, institutions, uh, powers. It has, it has nothing to do with the actual faith. It's a violent cult, and it's a criminal enterprise at the end of the day because it's professionalizing the practice of uh, international terrorism. That is a uh, criminal enterprise. So this political divisiveness that's ensued, uh, it only serves to conceal what it's really there. It helps to preserve and the ongoing terrorist enterprise, in my opinion. And this manifests itself in mass shootings. Uh, and so we're meant to say this is the number one threat. So a mass shooting, like James James Tracy was referring to, or a San Bernardino event, is the number one threat to America, even though by statistics it's not even close in terms of gun violence, inner city gun violence in a city like Chicago. It dwarfs uh, the so-called high-profile media-driven mass shootings. So again, this is a political construct uh, which has been uh, promoted. So I don't know what you're. I see you guys looking at each other, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I Patrick, I, I want to get your take on the specifics about the white paramilitaries that have been implicated both in Paris and in San Bernardino. Uh, this conference on Islamophobia, the mainstream one that we went to yesterday talks a lot about racism and Islamophobia is a form of racism. Would you say it's racist when reliable eyewitnesses, uh, large numbers of them report that shooters uh, who in, in acts attributed to brown-skinned foreign-looking Muslims are actually big white paramilitaries? Talk about that in Paris and in San Bernardino. Sure. Well, we, we heard similar reports to this uh, in the Mumbai attacks. That's a good example that, that I can refer to is initial reports, blonde-haired, uh, tall European uh, shooters, uh, if you will. But again, in, in the terms of San Bernardino, I have to refer back to the burden of proof. And it's quite clear to me, and I brought this point up uh, very early on in this event, and it has not been challenged yet, that we're meant to believe uh, from our estimation based on the photographic uh, evidence, uh, the height of the husband and the wife. Uh, the wife would be a Pakistani wife, uh, roughly five foot three to five foot four, uh, roughly 120 pounds. And we're meant to believe that she's carrying a full tactical package, uh, body armor, and able to handle uh, 
a assault rifle, which is a .223 Smith & Wesson automatic rifle. And if you've ever fired a rifle before, not even that rifle, any shotgun, you know what it takes physically um, and, and the amount of strength to carry the reloads and, you know, you're carrying equipment, you've got a pipe bomb in one hand. You're meant to believe that this housewife, essentially, is uh, a G.I. Jane. And so it's a suspension of of belief that she we're meant to hold. While she tweeted while she was shooting, remember. And, and, and tweeted while they're shooting. And this is the same also, the tweeting while shooting happened in Garland, Texas. That is clearly, a, in our opinion and many others, a completely staged event, uh, which what the organize, you only left to look at some of the organizers like Pamela Geller to see that this was a politicized staged event that involved uh, a, a so-called terrorist, Elton Simpson, a Muslim convert from Phoenix that had an FBI handler who was paid $125,000, a Somalian American, or sorry, Sudanese American, was paid $125,000 in order to uh, shadow Elton Simpson for a period of years. And we're meant to just discount all that and the FBI's involvement in Garland and say that this was an organic ISIS-inspired event, again, tweeting while shooting at the end. So, and you can get into a lot of details. These cases fall apart. They disintegrate as soon as you start to look into the details of them. And I think in the case of uh, Paris and many other events that might be now deemed classified under a national security letter, that would be very difficult to get to the bottom of uh, uh, to, to look at the case, to, to look in detail at what's going on in order to better find out maybe who who are the actual perpetrators of these crimes. Now, I'm going to put this in a historical context, which is important, which is you know, if you look at Operation Gladio, which was a real uh, European NATO intelligence-driven uh, domestic terror program from 1960s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s, and you look at an event um, like the Brabant massacres in Belgium, which was around 1990 and involved uh, the massacre of Belgian civilians. This was happening right at the time the U.S. was trying to place nuclear-tipped Euro missiles, cruise missiles, uh, in the NATO countries. Okay, and there was some pushback to that, and then all of a sudden this event happened. This, this, there are many examples within the Gladio portfolio, and I contend that no one has ever done prison time for Gladio, therefore I would assume that this is still a viable operation and I saw Paris as absolutely a perfect blueprint uh, and again with the Belgium connection of Operation Gladio, only that we've taken communism and maybe extreme right-wing politics of the 1960s and 70s that and reactionary uh, uh, organizations, left-wing organizations maybe that were used or infiltrated through Gladio in the 70s and 80s and now we've replaced it with Islamic extremism, which is, again, a political, radical Islam being a political construct to be managed and to be directed and to be steered uh, by those same exact agencies. To discount this as a possibility, to me, would be uh, reckless and irresponsible by anybody who's investigating it, and yet that is what we see. So I find that to be extraordinary. Just I'm glad you're there, uh, Patrick. Um... Interestingly, uh, again, Le Monde, just after the attacks, a couple of days after the, after the attacks, published an article about Gladio. And they didn't mention Gladio, but they talked about the terror campaign, uh, the years of lead, as they called them, that uh, struck Italy in particular. And um, it was really interesting. It was uncanny to see an article about, you know, like a state terror campaign, where they did even mention in the article that there was complicity with state services, state security services. They actually mentioned that in the article, but didn't go into any detail, didn't mention, you know, Daniel Ganser's work, Daniele Ganser's work, which is probably the most important work that was done. I mean, it was his PhD thesis, is the only doctorate that was ever actually done on this. Um, and they didn't even mention that, and they talked about the historians. You know, the historians are now sort of, you know, talking about reconciliation and reestablishing kind of trust in the state and so on in Italy. And it was almost as if the journalist was kind of saying, you know, there are things I'd like to talk about more in that little part where I talk about state complicity, but because I can't, and I'm, I'm just going to publish this, but maybe somebody who's intelligent enough will do some research on the internet and realize that kind of this is where we're at now. You know, you that um, it's almost like they're putting that out there, saying, you know, well, let's talk a little bit about Gladio, but I can't say it, and 
I mean, it's just that kind of another point that you make, which is important as well, is that I think that perhaps the science of our time is theater studies. Because if you were to look at the war on terror, I mean, you mentioned words like hyperbole. Uh, all of the liter literary tropes that are used, like hyperbole, uh, suspension of disbelief. I mean, it, you know, mm -hmm. it, you, it, in a way, fiction has overtaken reality. We've, 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 we live in a world where, in order to understand reality, you need to understand literature. You need to actually understand how to read a text um, and, and sort of where the object actors are, where the subject actors are, you know, what the focalization is. It's, it, it's literature is the science of our time because lit, it, the fictional world has overtaken the real world and we're now living in this kind of, um, you know, it, 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 I, can't, I guess that's because of, you know, the, because of Hollywood, because of people are just subjected to, you know, the, the kind of Hollywood films where the deus ex machina trope is constantly used, you know, there's a crisis and then the West comes in, God from a machine comes in at the end of the play to save the day, and we were completely conditioned to believe that, so whenever people come home from work and watch television, what they're watching on television is some kind of a script whereby, you know, there's been a bomb somewhere and the good guys are coming in, you know, like the LA cops you see in any American film that come in and, you know, um, yeah, and, and yeah. So, way, yeah, the disbelief is is really the, the the key to this. You know, we're supposed to just completely suspend any disbelief we have about anything. It's just like, you know, it doesn't matter that they were white guys. It doesn't matter that the guys in the Charlie Hebdo uh, attacks had blue eyes, and that was admitted by Caroline Forrest, who's one of the main, you know, state. Zionist ideologues in France. Uh, she admitted it on television that he had blue eyes and so on. Um, doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. You know, you don't need to ask any questions about about anything. You know, I mean, just reading coming in again in in in, in on uh, you know the recent report, uh, the most um, recent reports on the French strikes in Syria, where um, the French military were complaining they didn't have enough bombs. And so they, they've been asking the Americans to, to give them some munitions. And the reason why they don't want bombs is because they gave them all to the Saudis. You know, and then just a couple of days ago, I mean, it's been, you know, admitted, I think even Donald Trump admitted it. Uh, someone, actually, it's, an, it's another thing I'll come to later, and I, I'd ask you about that. Donald Trump was asked about the Saudis, and he said, sure, everybody knows the Saudis are supporting terrorism. You know, I mean, so, like, it's like it's admitted here in the press. Everybody knows that, right? Everybody knows that Saudi Arabia supports the Islamic State. And here the, the French are support trying to bomb the Islamic State, but they don't have enough bombs because they gave them all to the Saudis who are giving mm -hmm. it to the Islamic State. We're not supposed to ask any questions about that because we're in the theater of the absurd and we're waiting for Act 2, and in Act 2, you know, where God was supposed to turn up or whatever, right? So it doesn't, it's, it's, it, we're kind of, you know, we're really, people are just being treated as complete idiots. And I think um, it's this sort of dictate, you know, this, what, what I call this kind of di this stultification of society. People are just being reduced to automatons who are not entitled or not supposed to question anything. And, and an expert is essentially somebody who is uh, there to, you know, um, sort of introduce the next act or just kind of comment on yeah. some of the metaphors and adjectives yeah. in the previous act, right? That's his job. Can I interject? Uh, yeah, yeah um, let me interject on that point. Um, so uh, we actually have a report up at 21st Century Art today that goes into this exact subject, which is that the, uh, the the discourse, the narrative of all these events, which are incredibly complex events in terms of if you're talking about Syria, Turkey, uh, Kurdistan, uh, the energy plays, uh, the Islamic State, etc., Israel. You talk about these, this is incredibly complex, but it's meant to be boiled down into, uh, compartmentalized into a very basic binary conversation of good guys and bad guys. And I can't tell you how many times I've counted that I hear not only media pundits using the term good guys and bad guys, military experts coming on, Pentagon officials using good guys and bad guys, but uh, White House officials using the terms good guys and bad guys. The reality is that it's a lot more complex than this, and in terms of what we're seeing right now in Syria, this is a very complex country, this is a very complex situation, it's very sensitive. Arab people, people who live in that region will attest to this, they know about it, but the West, they don't have a clue, and our political leaders, unfortunately, have less of a clue. They only latch on to certain uh, uh, buzzwords and Shiite, Sunni, and they understand those binaries, and they, they try to maximize those in their political rhetoric, 
but the reality is they don't know what they're talking about. And in many cases, the President of the United States doesn't actually know what he's talking about. He's only able to comment on the surface of the conversation and not the nuances like you were talking about before and not really the deep geopolitics or the historical context which is so important when you're trying to unravel this lattice so this is a num this is a ma major problem and you we do need artists we do need people who are skilled in literature to reform the discourse to reshape the, to come up with new terms to come up with new ways to describe the situation and not only rely on uh, our media uh, heroes and our political leaders to do this job for us because they're doing an absolutely horrible job of it and they're failing miserably and and this then it becomes managed chaos but in terms of terror what the war on terror essentially does is it conceals it's a political construct it conceals the real agenda in the Middle East which is regime change okay that is a criminal enterprise okay this is the overthrow of countries and of nations uh, flipping of cultures create in creating civil wars that's an international criminal organized crime enterprise which is done by governments and organized crime syndicates collude and corporations colluding together to do criminal acts it's it's concealed and covered and sanitized by a political construct called the war on terror the war on drugs is almost the same thing. This is a uh, uh, prohibition. Uh, narco empires are f are able to be maintained and formed through this political idea of the war on drugs, and it allows business to keep on carrying on as usual. Uh, the war on climate. You saw all this in Paris. This is another thing that's allowed corporations, the fracking industry, the GMO industry, completely off the hook. The criminal enterprises in that in in those categories. All, no prying eyes there, no uh, no reciprocity, no judicial justice. They're able to get away with it because there's been a political overlay called the war on climate. Okay, and the, you could even extend this to a degree to the Occupy, uh, a war on the one percent. It's a political construct to avoid the bankers themselves, the individuals who are guilty of uh, organized crime, cartels, uh, off the hook completely because everyone's focusing on a political construct and so but the problem here with terrorism it's extremely dangerous because the phantom menace ends up becoming real after a period of time and after enough money is invested enough arms are flooded into the region enough people are killed uh, enough strife and economic strife is invested and then the, the managed chaos begins then the, the, these things last for generations and so well, don't, don't, don't we have a question for you yeah, yeah I have with a comment that, uh, of course, the word terror has to be the most torqued word in the entire language right now. And, of course, there was a time when uh, we had something called freedom fighters, and there was a, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, state emerged from uh, citizens taking up arms against King George, etc. Uh, you know, we just have to go back a little bit in time and see Nelson Mandela, who was in charge of the military wing of the uh, African National Congress, uh, and uh, there is uh, somebody who would be, in today's language, condemned as a, a terrorist. And and uh, you know, who are the experts? Where does this come from? Well, you know, uh, Palestine in 1946, the King David Hotel, the uh, right wing of the Zionist movement, Ergun and the Stern Gang, uh, the roots of the Likud Party, which uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, leads. You know, they blow up the. King David Hotel, where the Palestinian mandate, the British mandate is. And of course, this is a very, you know, this is the classic almost casebook study of the use of terrorism uh, to command media attention. And so the real experts on it are, you know, the now called the Likud Party. And uh, of course, this expertise is demonstrated in 1979, this conference that we keep on talking about. So, you know, the, this word uh, terrorism or the word radicalization, this is torqued language. People, you know, intelligent people at university conferences and such, they, they throw around the word terrorist as if it means something, as if it identifies something that we all agree. Or, you know, the, the term 9-11 is thrown about as if there is a consensus. When there is no consensus, it's a, a, a totally contested. Um, so, so uh, th this uh, use of the term uh, and the term Islamic State, where it's not a state, that's the whole point, and, and to build up the idea that, that there is this state 
this we saw in the Canadian um, event in uh, October of 2014. And Patrick, I was pleased to see you, you know, wrote quite uh, a bit about the Canadian episode. And, uh, you know, we, we've seen how, how that was torqued. Uh, there has been a little bit of critical commentary, for, for instance, from uh, Professor McQueen, who asked for an independent inquiry and points out all the uh, problems in the official interpretation. Uh, Barry's vicar, you know, it comes from the truthers of uh, Professor McMurtry, John McMurtry. There has been critical commentary on that particular uh, event. Um, could you help me uh, understand your point of view on what happened in Canada in 2014? And it's got to be brief because we're we're almost out of time. Sure. Um, I is for in terms of the Ottawa shooting, uh, it it it's identical to a number of other similar shootings, but uh, you can get into the nuts and bolts of those cases, and we've documented a lot of that at 21st Century Wire. But uh, you know that that's one aspect of it. But what we're really what I look at that I really pay attention to is the sort of reactionary, the emotive, the politicized uh, policies and rhetoric that comes out of. In the, in the immediate aftermath of these events, and they seem to f to flow into two main policy nodes. Uh, one of them is domestic security. So, in this, and it's basically these events are being used time and time again to ramp up the police state uh, in the, any of these countries or in the continent. So that's one of them. The other one is uh, a clash of civilizations, which feeds into uh, further military deployment uh, in the Middle East. And the beneficiaries are well known for this type of a foreign policy. So that's problem, reaction, solution once again. Uh, and again, there's another one, which is the Islamist reformist movement, which not many people are talking about, which is being pushed very, nudged very gradually through the United States media right now. And this is well funded. And in case, uh, in many cases, you find Israeli lobby money or Israeli organizations also funding some of the foundations that are pushing and the people pushing this in US media. So again, this is an old trick that goes back from the Romans to the kings of Europe to the British Empire, which is to further compartmentalize and to divide and to rule uh, through these very splinter activities, uh, which is essentially social engineering. But it needs a kind of autoimmune response. It needs to have uh, it needs chemotherapy in order to make it work, and I believe that the creation of ISIS and the Islamic State by all the stakeholders uh, in the region uh, is that kind of chemotherapy to uh, reform, to uh, compartmentalize, to maybe further divide Islam as they've done with Christianity in the past uh, and other sort of regions, races countries and faiths. Uh, so this is an age-old tactic. This is what is happening now. There can be no doubt about it because the talking points are almost synchronized now. Everyone thinking about we need to reform Islam, we need to dial it down. It's too extreme. It's too radical. The Quran is a violent book, etc. These are the rhetorics and this is also being used to funnel into left and right, so liberal and conservative. Uh, uh, dialectic as well. So they're imposing a liberal conservative left-right dialectic over this issue when in fact it doesn't belong there. But yet this is what's happening. So this is what Donald Trump is representing as well, uh, a very important aspect of this conversation in the United States. So it's manipulative uh, and it's, des it's designed to create to propagate the fear which you talked about before but also to maintain some of these important uh, policy goals domestically uh, and internationally, and we'll never get to the bottom of the true problem because these are only dealing with uh, the the dialectical narrative, uh, which is the consensus reality, which we're meant to uh, believe uh, based on what the media or politicians have decided is is the dialectic. Okay, so, in terms of there, Patrick, because uh, okay. I appreciate the holes that you've helped puncture in the consensus reality or consensus hallucination, whichever it may be, <laughs> and I appreciate your great work at 21stCenturyWire.com. Everybody should keep an eye on that website. So, once again, thank you, Patrick Henningsen. Appreciate your great work. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Thank you guys very much. Okay, take care. Okay, Patrick Henningsen of 21st Century Wire. We're going to move on now to one of the Islamic world's most important scholars, uh, Imran Hossein. I should call him Sheikh Imran Hossein because he has more than earned that accolade. 
is perhaps the Islamic world's leading eschatologist. Have you ever watched Christian Sunday morning people uh, talk about the end times? Well, you can hear a vastly more informed, uh, articulate, and sophisticated version of that kind of discourse by listening to Sheikh Imran Hussein. And many, many people do, not just Muslims. People from all faith backgrounds or no faith background find what Sheikh Imran has to say is uh, very, very important and relevant to today's issues. Whether or not you are a true believer in the scriptural interpretations that he weaves in, uh, you have to admit that Sheikh Imran Hussein is doing brilliant work. Uh, he's the author of Gog and Magog in the Quran and many other great works of fantastic interpretation of Surat al-Kaf. Uh, let's go ahead and play the recording that we just made a couple of days ago for this conference of a special interview with Sheikh Imran Hussein. He wasn't able to do it live, so we have a pre-recorded discussion with him, and I think we can go ahead and cue that up right now. Uh, hello, we are at the False Flag Islamophobia Conference, or rather recording a video for the False Flag Islamophobia Conference in Paris, December 12th. Uh, this is a reaction to the banning of a, an academic paper for the Islamophobia and Civil Society Conference. Um, I'm Kevin Barrett. My paper was originally accepted by the committee for that conference which is uh, scheduled for the 11th of December in Paris, and we still don't know whether it's actually going to be held. But in the wake of the recent events in Paris, that is the Friday the 13th of November false flag or terror attack, take your pick, um, that paper became too hot to handle, and the committee notified me that my paper was no longer acceptable for presentation at the conference, even though it had originally been accepted. So we are hosting an alternative conference, the False Flag Islamophobia Conference, to examine the question of what is the role of false flag uh, attacks in the construction of Islamophobia and the larger historical context uh, around this question. Here to speak with us is Sheikh Imran Hossein. Sheikh Imran Hossein is widely recognized as the Islamic world's leading expert on eschatology and its relation to current events. He is a brave truth speaker who spoke out boldly and forthrightly about the apparent uh, false flag attacks in New York on September 11, 2001, and was essentially exiled from the United States for having done so. Uh, he's probably the, the leading Muslim authority to address this question, uh, the leading Islamic scholar that we could ask about this uh, question of Islamophobia, false flags, and the larger context. So, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Imran. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Kevin, I'm honored to be interviewed on this very important subject, and I'm happy that you are persisting with the with the presentation on uh, Islamophobia, uh, even though your paper has now been considered to be too too hard to handle. But the truth, the truth must be proclaimed without regard for consequences. I mean. So when you uh, look at this series of apparent uh, deceptions designed to incite people to create fear, uh, to trigger wars, uh, rollbacks of civil liberties, to turn the West into a garrison state, uh, you see that the, this, these false flags are actually uh, becoming very common. And although Islamophobia is one of the purposes of these false flags, uh, there's a wider context as well. Yes, Kevin, I'm very happy that you have directed attention to the wider context because I would like that our listening audience, our viewing audience should recognize that it's not just Islam that is being targeted, not at all. Uh, uh, Orthodox Christianity is also being targeted. Orthodox Christianity, which of course is led by Russia. Uh, the attack on the Russian aircraft in Syria. Uh, uh, and uh, the cover-up for that with a mountain of lies, a uh, shameless display of lies by the Turkish Prime Minister uh, and the Turkish government, uh, to, the, to, the, um, to, to no one's surprise, really, uh, because they're simply doing what the Ottoman Empire did before them, uh, waging a relentless so-called jihad on, Syria, on, on Russia on behalf of the West. 
so it's not just Islam and Muslims who are being targeted. The larger picture is one in which we recognize that Orthodox Christians are also being targeted by these false flag attacks. And uh, in order for us to, uh, to, to locate uh, that which explains this phenomenon of false flag attacks and the increasing frequency with which they are now in occurring, in fact, I anticipate that uh, as uh, ISIS people uh, go back home, <laughs> You know, in order to become a member of ISIS, you've got to take a pledge of allegiance to the leader. And if the leader tells you to kill, you've got to kill. So these are time bombs that are going back home <laughs> from the battlefield. And when they go back home, they, they lie low until the, the ISIS command gives them an order to commit an act of terrorism. And then they will do it because they are obliged by religious law to do it because they took a pledge of allegiance to that. Um, so I'm anticipating an avalanche of uh, false flags that will come in the future uh, with these um, silent people returning home, members of ISIS from all over the world, with um, eyes and yet they cannot see, with ears they cannot hear, with hearts who cannot understand. They're just like, like cattle. And I'm sad to say so, but it seems to me that the Salafi methodology is, is playing a very significant role in creating this huge universal herd of cattle who are now becoming time bombs for future false flags. And these people, of course, are patsies or participants in false flags that are actually uh, set up in some cases or assisted by Western authorities. Oh, well, ISIS is created by the, by the Zionists, the Mossad, and ISIS is created by the CIA, and they're the ones who do the planning and they're the ones who pull all the strings from behind the scenes. So it is uh, the Mossad who no longer have to send their men on the line. They're going to have they're going to have Muslims who are going to function as guinea pigs, um, on acting on their behalf, committing an avalanche of false flag to acts of terrorism, which I'm anticipating to start very soon. Um, what is the role that these false flags are playing? And uh, what is the mission? What is their mission? What is their goal? Uh, we have to look at the larger picture to understand why they're using false flags. And then finally, we'd look at uh, what are the consequences for them. Those who practice false flags, what is the price that they will eventually pay? Um, our eschatological perspective is one in which we recognize that that little island off the coast of Europe did not become a ruling state in the world by accident, no. Uh, Napoleon had contemptuously dismissed Britain as a nation of shopkeepers. Britain had never played any significant role in Europe until suddenly a scientific and technological revolution came uh, with lit Britain leading the way and it gave to Britain a military technology and military power uh, which we wish to be able to have ships which no longer dependent on the wind, and uh, Britain em eventually emerged as a ruling state in the world. And not only in terms of military technology and military power and control over naval bases around the world, but also with Britain becoming the financial capital of the world. The, re the transfer from uh, a monetary system of gold and silver coins now to a banking system, uh, the Bank of England. Um, and Britain becomes a financial center of the world, money lender of the world, par excellence. Um, Pax Britannica had a very mysterious relationship with the Holy Land. And I need to remind our viewing audience and listening audience of only the Balfour Declaration of 1917, where Britain, which is a secular state, pledges to work for the establishment of a Jewish national home, or religious state, in the Holy Land. How do we explain that? And then the passage from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana, they call it Pax, but it's not peace. It's actually war and a mountain of lies and oppression. And the United States of America takes over from Britain. The US dollar takes over from the sterling pound. And the United States maintains also this very mysterious relationship with the Holy Land, with the state of Israel, and becomes a protector of Israel until Israel grows and grows and grows to become the equivalent of a superpower. 
And now we are located at that moment in time, Kevin, when we see from our eschatological perspective, the United States in a state of irreversible decline, the US dollar on its way out, and uh, a third state emerging to replace the United States, which we recognize to be Israel. Now, could this partly explain why we're seeing so many false flags targeting Muslims and Islam? Because Israel is, of course, created in the heart of historically uh, Islamic Holy Land. Uh, it seems odd, doesn't it, that this tiny little country whose problem with Islam has uh, is really a, a local issue for their you know 10, 10 million population, 5, 6 million Jews in Israel. But somehow the entire West, even the world, has been hijacked into a kind of a global war on Islam. The, the that's right, global Kevin. War on terror. Yeah, that's right, Kevin. Uh, Israel is located right bang in the middle of a sea of Islam, surrounded by Muslims. And so Islam poses for Israel the first and most important threat. But in addition to that, Israel is not, the Jews are not the only ones who are the, with a claim to Jerusalem. In addition to the Jews, your Christian claim to Jerusalem. All right? And that Christian claim to Jerusalem is not to be exclusively Western Christian, but also Eastern Christian, Orthodox Christianity. And that's why we see the, the two, the two, uh, the dual pronged attack on uh, both Muslims and and Orthodox Christians. Israel perceives both of these to be the most important threats to a Pax Judaica, which is to replace Pax Americana. Uh, when we look at the, the emergence of Pax Britannica, we see that it took place with large, with great wars, large numbers of people being killed. And then we see the passage from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana and the two big world wars, Hundred, millions of people killed. And then we see the, the, the Pax Americana stamping its bloody feet around the world with millions being killed. And now the passage from Pax Americana to Pax Judaica, and we share with the listening and viewing audience our perception that this passage cannot take place without the greatest war of all. The Christian eschatology recognizes it as the Armageddon, and Islamic eschatology recognizes it as the Melhama. And uh, in order for this passage to take place, in order to take the world to this great, great war that is to come, and save the Jews from being blamed for that war, you need to have a lot of deception at work. And my first comment is that the false flags are meant to shift the burden, shift the blame, put the blame on an innocent people. So that the real masterminds, the ones who want to rule the world, who are taking us to nuclear war, which is going to devastate mankind, and most of mankind will not survive, that at the end of that great war that is coming, and it is so soon that I anticipate it's probably going to be a year from now, or even less than that. At the end of that great war, the world will not be hunting down Jews to kill them and blaming them for what has happened. So you have to put the blame on someone else. And this is why I think this is the first comment I want to make for Islamophobia, uh, to put the blame on Muslims. And you, we are the ones who are posing a threat to mankind. We are the ones who are a menace to mankind. And therefore, whatever big, big tragedy occurs in the future, we are the ones who are going to be blamed for it. And do you, do you think that the two events in Paris this year, which both appear to have been false flags, uh, are somehow tied into the role of France in all of this, because France, number one, has the biggest Jewish community in Europe with a half a million Jews, and then secondly, France is the capital of world secularism and has been since the French Revolution. The French body politic essentially is held together by a shared agreement among the majority of French people to oppose religion, specifically Catholicism. That's been the center of gravity of French politics for 200 years. But now there's no more Catholicism really in France to hate, so they need somebody new to hate. And it appears that these two false flags have been staged in part to rally the French people behind a new kind of hatred of a different religion uh, and, and for other reasons as well. What do you think? Yes, I, I agree with you, Kevin. I think that's a very valid analysis. I would like to, to add to that, however, that um, 
the, the NATO is moving incrementally towards a war with Russia. The target is nuclear Russia because everything that they have tried has failed. They uh, seduced Russia into the First World War with a promise of Constantinople. <laughs> And when Russia was within an arm's length of Constantinople, they didn't want Russia to get Constantinople. So they, they brought in the Bolshevik Revolution and liquidated the family of the Tsars, and then brought communism and the Soviet Union, which butchered Orthodox Christians for 60, 70 years, and brought into being the, first, the world's first atheist state, Russia's heart. Is spiritual. Their heart in the Western world is barbarian, but Russia's heart is spiritual. And they, they brought communism and the Soviet Union to try to destroy that spiritual heart of Russia. And they gave to the Soviet Union military um, nuclear technology. They gave it, they transferred it, so that the Soviet Union could become the pride of the Russian people. And it did become, in some respects, the pride of the Russian people. But then eventually they planned their plan, and Allah planned his plans, and this, the Soviet Union collapsed, and communism is in the garbage bin of history. Then they tried with yet let's see to, to, to see how they could they could um, uh, steal Russia's wealth <laughs> and reduce Russia to poverty. But even that didn't work. And then now Russia is returning to Orthodox Christianity, and Russia is flexing her muscles and saying, "We're not afraid of you." And they can't tolerate this. But the most important thing of all is that Russia is threatening their control over money. The BRICS attack on their petrodollar monetary system is the most dangerous threat that they're facing. And this is why they have to uh, attack Russia to force Russia's submission uh, to their diktat. And because China is supporting Russia, the war will be on China as well. Now, how do you how do you move towards that world war? The the American people have had enough of wars, and it's going to be very difficult to market this to American public opinion. The British also are fed up with wars, and it's going to be very difficult for British government to market a world war to the British public. Hmm? So I think. Uh, Kevin, I, I, I may be wrong, but this is my opinion that uh, they chose France because they felt they had a better chance with French public opinion. And so the first, uh, what's called the, the Charlie Hebdo attack took place to prepare French public opinion. And it was a, it was a stupendous success. They had 45 heads of state marching within hours <laughs> on the streets of Paris. And, um, and the French were duped. The French were duped. And the mainstream media, of course, once they have the mainstream media, they don't care about the alternative media now. The mainstream media is going to hold public opinion. And so when they felt that French public opinion had been sufficiently mobilized, they could come with the second one now. And the second one, which just occurred in November, I believe was meant to push France into a, a, a greater military role in Syria and Iraq, and to spearhead the effort so that the United States and Britain can emerge, can can enter on the coattail of France, and this is what is happening now. So it's a it's a, um, a an incremental movement towards war with Russia, and the pieces are all falling in place now. And the pity about it is when this war takes place, I don't think there's going to be any Europe left after it and North America. The people won't be able to live in that part of the world. So they're being taken for a ride, and just this Islamophobia conference should try to wake up people to the fact that you're being taken for a ride, and at the end of the day, you won't be able to live in North America. You won't be able to live in Europe. These places, these pe these places will not be habitable. Now, the other point I'd like to make is that they are committing false acts, acts of terrorism, and putting the blame on Muslims. But our perspective is that we who have faith in the one God, the God of Abraham, 
that every Jew believes in the God of Abraham, every Christian believes in the God of Abraham, has created this world as a moral order. This is not a frivolous world. This is not a world which is moving helter-skelter in the historical process, no. It is a moral order. And the implication of being a moral order is the truth must eventually emerge triumphant in the world. The implication of the world being a moral order is that those who are now committing false flags acts of terrorism with a mountain of lies, we say to them, Kevin, that your false flag chickens are one day going to come home to roost. Your false flag chickens are one day going to come home to roost. And monstrously evil acts of terrorism are going to take place. And you will be blamed for it. And you're going to pull your hands up and say, no, 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 we didn't do it. We, but nobody will believe you at that time. Because you are preparing the way now for your own slaughter tomorrow. In fact, Mankind will be so fed up with you. Mankind will have so much hatred for you tomorrow because of what you're doing today. That we say to you, tomorrow even the trees and the stones will speak. And I'll call on mankind to come and punish you. Do you see that happen <laughs> after a great war? Not immediately after the Great War, because I am saying to you that ISIS is preparing the way for an avalanche of false flags to come. That every single member of ISIS who returns home from the battlefield there in Syria and Iraq and returns home is a ticking time bomb, because he's taken a pledge of allegiance to the leader, and the leader is himself being pulled by the strings led by the, the Mossad and the CIA. So the Mossad and the CIA are to use all of these people, Muslims, since they are Muslims, but misguided, returning home from the battlefield and use them as time bombs. And when the order is given to commit an act of terrorism, to assassinate someone, they are going to do it because they have a religious duty now to obey the leader. So then they, they're not going to have any problems now. They don't have to train people <laughs> because they're going to have Muslims committing acts of terrorism that they would plan for them. Interesting, That's because in, in the Paris attacks on Friday the 13th of November, uh, it appears that it may have been a hybrid attack in which there were some uh, ISIS-type people from Muslim backgrounds who were involved but also some uh, professional white mercenaries who were blamed for the shooting at uh, at least one of the restaurants. And they've disappeared completely from the reports, from the headlines, from the French government's inquiry. Uh, and likewise, it does seem that some of the uh, ostensibly Muslim patsies may have been manipulated. That is, the people who blew themselves up outside the stadium appear to have gone off away from other people and simply blown themselves up which is a kind of a strange thing for them to do. Some have speculated that they may have been blown up by remote control. Uh, and then this latest uh, thing in San Bernardino, it appears there that there, there are uh, at least two witnesses who clearly saw that there were three white paramilitary guys uh, carrying out the shooting as a paramilitary operation. So it actually wasn't the Muslim couple that's been blamed. So it seems like there's a sort of a, a possibility of hybrids in which patsies sometimes actually do some shooting and sometimes they don't, but that the paramilitary forces and their controllers are really the ones who organize these things. The one that took place in November in Paris was far, far, far too important, strategically important, because it is it is meant to prepare the way for war with Russia. So it, they could not have left that to amateur, <laughs> amateur Muslims who are angry with the West, no. You had to have had very, very professionally trained people to commit the, the, that, those acts of terrorism in Paris. But in addition to that, you must have a cover, and you have these Muslims who can be used as a cover. Um, but Kevin, I don't think they need this for the future. Once they have their forces in place, that Britain and United States and France and Germany are in, 
Russia, in, 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 in Syria, and Iraq. NATO is there. The pieces are all in place now. It's just one, one shot. Another Russian airline, for example, shot down. And that's it. The war, now, the, the war begins. And it can begin any time now. They have, the pieces are all in place. They don't need these big acts of terrorism anymore. What they need is to continue the Islamophobia with, with, with the avalanche of acts of terrorism. And I think ISIS is going to do that for them uh, tomorrow. Okay, well, I think that's a, a very strong analysis as we've come to expect from you. Sheikh Imran Hossein, the Islamic world's leading eschatologist and analyst of contemporary affairs. I certainly hope your, your view of the coming uh, great war turns out not to be the case, but unfortunately there's plenty of evidence apparently both uh, from scripture and from what we see every day in the news that you very likely could be right about this. So in any case, uh, whatever uh, Allah brings us in this world, I thank you uh, and may Allah bless you for your truth speaking and truth seeking and I look forward to future contact with you inshallah. Thank you, Kevin, and may Allah protect you, and I admire the work that you're doing, and there are many, many, many people in the world, like me, who admire the work that you're doing, admire your courage, admire your integrity, admire the brilliance of your analysis of contemporary affairs, and may Allah protect you and increase you in wisdom and knowledge. Barakallahu feek. Amen. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Alaikum assalamu alaikum. So that was Sheikh Imran Hossein, the Islamic world's leading eschatologist and one of its most important scholars. Well, let's move on to a slightly different domain for our next pre-recorded guest. Robert David Steele is a former CIA clandestine services officer. He has been involved in covert operations. He knows his counterterrorism. Since he left the CIA, Robert David Steele has been trying to make the world better, and he has become the world's leading uh, expert and activist on the notion of open source intelligence. He says the CIA bungles so many things, does so much harm, and much of what it does is uh, conditioned on the fact that it's trying to, to be keep secrets and do private intelligence. Most of what it does is useless because you can get better intelligence just by paying attention to what's going on in the world, especially with the communications tools we have today. This is a brilliant idea. Robert David Steele has run for president. Uh, he is running again. Uh, he's seeking the libertarian nomination for president in the 2016 elections in the USA. So without further ado, let's listen to Robert David Steele. Welcome to a special pre-recorded episode from the False Flag Islamophobia Conference in Paris, France on Saturday, December 12th, 2015. I'm Kevin Barrett, a uh, host and co-organizer of the conference along with Professor Tony Hall of the University of Lethbridge in Canada. Our special guest uh, in this pre-recorded session is Robert David Steele. Robert David Steele is a former CIA clandestine services officer and one of our leading, if not perhaps the leading proponent of open source intelligence. Now, that's actually quite a thing to say about anyone because open source intelligence is a kind of revolution that's sweeping the world. That's pretty much what I do as an editor at Veterans Today and a lot of other folks are doing this as well, but Robert David Steele has actually gotten a sense of the big picture. He's also not afraid to speak out here we're talking about false flag Islamophobia in general and the recent attacks in San Bernardino and Paris in particular uh, to have get a sense of what are false flag attacks. I guess a clandestine services specialist would probably know better than most folks. So hey, welcome, uh, Robert David Steele. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm glad to support your effort. I've read your stuff for a very long time. Appreciate it. So uh, let's, let's get started on this issue of false flags. It seems that the mainstream media and academy is not interested in this concept. Uh, you try to bring it up, they shout you down. I, I finally had a paper accepted at the mainstream academic conference in Paris on December 11th, 
the Islamophobia and Eroding Civil Society Conference, uh, sponsored by University of California at Berkeley, a professor and uh, a fully mainstream crew. And then, when the recent Paris attacks happened, they contacted me and said, well, we're sorry, we did accept your submission, but now we're going to have to retroactively reject it because the atmosphere is just too poisonous for this sort of thing. For you know, And these guys, I think, know the truth. They're just afraid to try to say it in the current atmosphere. And you've been trying to get these kinds of ideas uh, floated for many years. Uh, why do you think, well, well, first, you know, what is a false flag, and why is this concept hard to communicate to uh, many audiences? Well, let me let me say that in addition to being a former spy who's participated in in many covert operations where where we seek to influence opinion away from what the truth is, uh, I'm also the number one Amazon reviewer for nonfiction, uh, reading in 98 categories, and I've read deeply in the false flag area. In fact, there's an excellent book about Edward Lansdale and how the CIA got into false flags in a big way. Um, when it uh, tried them out in the Philippines and then it went on to do them in Vietnam when it fostered bombings of Buddhist monasteries and allegedly Buddhist attacks against the Catholics and so forth. Now false flag originated in the ocean because a ship that wanted to attack another ship would fly the false flag of that other ship and then when they were close enough they would surprise them. Uh, so they would achieve tactical surprise in the middle of the ocean. That's where the term originated. But essentially a false flag is a horrible event that's blamed on a political enemy and used as a pretext to achieve some other objective. Now in the case of the Paris false flag, which I'm quite certain that both were, were false flags, but this is based on an analytic matrix, not direct knowledge. Um, in the case of Paris, this legalizes the U.S. war on Syria, which is an illegal war. It uh, reinforces the French administration. It justifies more investments in mass surveillance. Uh, it punishes the French for supporting the Palestinians. And last but not least, it scares French Jews into moving to Israel, where they're desperate to fill up the illegal settlements. Uh, so for me, the false flag is always, the analysis always begins with who benefits? Uh, what is coming from this? Uh, I personally do not think that ISIS is actually a real movement. It's merely a theatrical movement created uh, by the United States, the CIA, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and others. ISIS does not do things that are not approved by its masters. Uh, and I believe ISIS could be shut down overnight if Turkey, Saudi Arabia, France, and the United States would agree. That's what many believe, uh, including our other video guest here at the conference, uh, Sheikh Imran Hossein. Uh, so, we, Sheikh Hussein thinks that we're likely to see an increased number of these false flags on the model of the shootings in Paris and San Bernardino, in part because thanks to this uh, rise of Islamic State, which he agrees with you is a false flag group in itself, a controlled group, uh, they have all kinds of potential patsies, and some of these patsies are actual terrorists, people who will indeed kill. Uh, when they're ordered to by the intelligence chiefs at the top. Uh, are you concerned that we could be seeing a, a bigger wave of these kinds of incidents? Well, well, yes, but let me put that in context. For, I want to do two things in the next few minutes. The first is I want to talk to you about false flags and cognitive dissonance and preconditions of revolution because publics are literally going mad. Uh, I personally think San, San Bernardino began as road rage between a messianic Jew and, and an ignorant Muslim and then it was hijacked and turned into a false flag operation and you yourself have written about three white mercenaries that were seen to be doing the shooting that tends to support that false flag indicator but if it had not been hijacked as a false flag it could have been written off as a Saturday night special we have people murdering each other in the United States every single day we had cops kill 140 people in March uh, of 2014. Um, my most popular profile came out in The Guardian in June of 2014 and it published the results of my 1976 uh, master's thesis on predicting revolution and the chart got a lot of attention, 68,000 likes, because it had in red the preconditions of revolution that exist in the United States and the United Kingdom today we are essentially creating massive unemployment. The unemployment rate in the United States is 23%. And at the same time, we're allowing ideological bigots in both the Republican and Democratic Party to create 
uh, hate and discontent. The Republican Party has done more to turn uh, white blue collar workers against the U.S. government than any other organization I know of. And I used to be a Republican. Um, so anytime you're evaluating a false flag, you also have to consider the possibility that this was a traffic accident, that this was road rage, Saturday night special, family vendettas. There are lots and lots of reasons for people to start killing each other and go nuts. And unfortunately, the U.S. government is doing nothing to address that larger condition across society. Now, I have published, and it's easy to find online, the tiny URL is false flag matrix, in lowercase, three words. So tiny URL forward slash false flag matrix. And key indicators of a modern fl uh, false flag, there are essentially um, uh, 10 of them, uh, are number one, uh, have you been warned? Has there been early warning and public alarm? Have people been said, oh my God, there's a false flag coming. We've got indications of a false flag. In fact, NSA, with all of the mass surveillance that it does, has never stopped a terrorist incident. It processes less than 1% of what it collects. We don't actually collect indications of, of uh, terrorist attacks. The FBI is actually fomenting them. There's a wonderful book called The Terror Factory which documents that 175 of the so-called terrorist incidents in the United States were funded by the FBI. The stupidest was a retarded Muslim kid who was given $3,000 to move out of his mother's home and start a terrorist cell. This was all FBI. It was all FBI in the World Trade Center the first time around. The second uh, indicator is scheduled official exercises coincident with the event. Uh, this is a major indicator. It applies to 9-11 when Dick Cheney took over. Uh, he was warned by 13 countries in advance. He scheduled a national uh, counterterrorism operation months in advance. The FEMA Emergency Center was set up on the piers of New York City the night before 9-11. And, of course, Larry Silverstein did not show up for his usual breakfast at 9-11. Um, so scheduled exercise, the prepared media narrative. One of the things we're starting to see is that the media jumps the gun. They have a prepared narrative and they make a mistake. Or one of the army reservists in the cyber warfare uh, center at Fort Meade makes a mistake and sends out a tweet too early. Um, so the media narrative is there. It's prepared a lot of times. I mean, uh, Geraldo Rivera's daughter is at the event. Uh, you know, please. Uh, there's some of this stuff is just too crazy to believe. Um, blocked public media and first responder access, access. One of the things I noticed in Boston bombing is that all of the priests and rabbis in that area rough, rushed to comfort the wounded. They were not allowed to get near them. Now, we have since learned that the, the famous amputee that was being rolled out was a hired actor. There are actually companies today that have military amputees, and they offer their services for military disaster exercises. Um, so we're starting to see more and more hired actors that are participating in exercises that are then sold to the public. Now, as how do they keep these flag. people quiet afterwards? Well, you know, it's a good question. I think on, on the one hand, they're making a lot of money. And on the other hand, some of them are simply being killed. Um, I can absolutely see... Uh, the impunity with which someone would load up a whole bunch of people saying they're going to the Caribbean to, to be gotten out of sight and just take the plane out of the sky. I don't actually know. But what I am seeing, take Sandy Hook, for example, all of these houses that were sold, all of these people that disappeared. Uh, take uh, the Boston bombing, where all of the first responders that were on vacation in Boston went to the hospital to help, and no bodies showed up. There literally was no traffic in the hospitals. They were told to go home. There was no need for them. Um, what I'm really trying to center on here is what we do know is we can no longer believe the government or the media narrative. And if you haven't had your hands in the blood and if you haven't actually reached out, and that's the other thing, false flag incidents do, uh, do um, create dead people. And these dead people can be patsies. They can be genuine terrorists who have been hijacked. Uh, once they've been allowed to come in and they've been facilitated and so on. So attackers die, actors live. But, you know, we've had NATO Gladio for a long time. And it's only in recent years that people have realized that the entire Italian fa uh, terrorist campaign was a NATO Gladio operation that was designed to terrorize Italy and put fascists in power. 
Something most people don't realize is that the U.S. government recovered the Japanese gold in the Philippines. This is a story told by my friend Sterling Seagraves in Gold Warriors. That became the Black Lily Trust Fund run out of the Treasury Department, and that is what financed the CIA funding, not only of the importation of Nazis into the United States, where there's still a major problem, but also the the uh, re-election of Nazis, of fascism, in Italy, Japan, and Germany. It was the United States of America and Japanese gold captured from the Chinese that was, that was used to put fascism back in power across Europe and in Asia. Um, so, so Philip you have the, whole... the Man in the High Castle, which posits that the Nazis actually won World War II, wasn't entirely wrong. Well, that's true, and in fact, you have to understand World War II would never have happened without funding from Switzerland, the United States, and the City of London, uh, just like the Civil War in the United States, which was actually a war of secession. The South had a right to secede. Uh, that was funded by the bankers. Wars don't happen unless the bankers want them to happen, and so we really have to understand that violence and false flag terrorism is financially profitable for a few. George Sotos, for example, is selling Europe short. Okay, he is profiting from this mass migration weapon. Um, you have real estate and you have statistics. For example, Sandy Hook, the FBI says nobody died in the official FBI statistics for Sandy Hook. Now, that could be a bureaucratic error. There are 18,000 police jurisdictions, and the FBI doesn't have a grip on data across the United States, but it's an indicator. You have the prompt official refutation or dismissal of expert voices. You have the crackdown on alternative voices, the most famous of which is uh, Gary Webb, who managed to commit suicide by putting not one but two bullets in his head, uh, and yet the official story is he committed suicide. Um, and we have now what we call Boston Breaks, which is journalists are being killed where their cars are being taken over with a computer chip that basically turns off the brakes and ramps up the speed and, and then burns up in, in the fire. You have legislation that has already been written that is rolled out and voted on the day after the event. That's what happened with the Patriot Act. That was written, ready to go. No one read it. They voted for it. It created a fascist state in the United States of America. Um, and then finally, the obvious question, who benefits? Go ahead, please. I'm sorry, I've lost your audio. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, Senator Feingold actually did read it, and uh, he stayed up all night reading it and recognized exactly what you said, that it was creating a fascist state, and it had to have been written long in advance. Well, you know, Dick Cheney has been in charge of continuity of government for a very long time, and he may still be in charge of it. Uh, there's no question that Mike Lofgren is right. We have a deep state. And in fact, I was having a conversation today. There's no such thing as a homogeneous U.S. government. Uh, we have at least seven governments that are in operation at any given time. When I was in, uh, in a foreign country as a CIA case officer, it was a very high-profile country, and I found I was dealing with seven different foreign policies. There was a Wall Street foreign policy, there was a Pentagon foreign policy, a Department of State foreign policy, a CIA foreign policy, a uh, drug criminal foreign policy run by DEA, uh, and then finally you had, um, you had a White House foreign policy. And none of these people agreed with each other. The general in charge of the country was very confused, and he ultimately went to jail because we couldn't agree on our own foreign policy. That's pretty much what I've heard from the uh, former high-level people uh, and sources through veterans today, that it, there is no such thing as the government. Now, that's kind of a scary thought, especially if parts of this government don't have our best interests at heart. Exactly. Well, I don't, you know, I, I really like to say, because I've served in this government proudly as both a uniformed Marine Corps infantry officer, as a Marine Corps civilian responsible for creating the Marine Corps Intelligence Center, which is when I realized just how ignorant our spy service was, and as a spy. Um, good people trapped in a bad system. But what we have done with U.S. politics is essentially turned it into theater. I mean, Chris Hedges wrote a wonderful book, Empire uh, of Illusion, uh, the, um, the End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle. Uh, that's absolutely right. And Matt Tavi has written a wonderful book on Griftopia. Uh, what, we, what we now have is a government that is essentially criminal, reckless, and it does not make evidence-based decisions. 
Uh, I recently wrote on Kindle a very short 99 cent book called An American Grand Strategy, evidence-based, affordable, balanced, and flexible. And I draw some pillars, what the White House could do, what the intelligence community could do, what diplomacy should do, and what the military should do at four levels, strategic, operational, tactical, and technical. Rule one in grand, grand strategy is stop doing bad stuff. The United States of America today is allowing morons like Newland in the State Department to do regime change. This is an out-of-control woman who should be fired immediately. Her husband should not be allowed to work in Washington, D.C. The neo-Nazis and neoconservatives in the United States have executed a foreign policy coup. And General Wesley Clark has said this on YouTube, and that YouTube is still available. So we are assassinating people with drones with a 98% collateral damage rate. We are still doing rendition and torture. We are still supporting uh, criminal elements and neo-Nazis across Europe. We are still supporting 40 of the 42 dictators on the planet. The only two we don't like are in Cuba and North Korea. Uh, all the other dictators are best pals of the U.S. government. This is a prescription for mass migration. And it seems that the false flags that have been coming recently have been pointing towards Syria. We're getting nonstop Islamic State propaganda. Uh, the Paris false flag was blamed on ISIS, which is apparently stampeding us into Syria to confront Russia. Uh, in fact, ISIS is actually our, our excuse for going in there because it's, it's our band of thugs. Uh, do, you, do you see this heading for conflict with Russia? Well, first off, I see Russia and Putin as the good guys. There's no question about it. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a real fan of Chuck Spinney and Patrick Cockburn. Uh, there are some really classy journalists that have gotten to the bottom of this. ISIS was created by CIA, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia when they did the rat line out of Libya. Uh, they basically started to destabilize Syria. ISIS is a creation of Saudi Arabia and the United States of America. Now it's being owned and controlled by Turkey because of the oil revenues that the president of Turkey and his son are so graciously making possible in, in contravention of every uh, international uh, accord. Um, for me, ISIS is a theatric group that has been created. It's also a group that would not be properly led if we hadn't broken Iraq. Uh, the Iraqi Sunni army officers are the ones who are leading many of the elements of ISIS. Um, we've basically created a swath of destruction from Afghanistan all the way down through the Middle East to Niger and Nigeria. I think Azerbaijan is the next to go. Uh, and I believe that NATO has been expanding in violation of the promise that George Bush made to Gorbachev. Uh, we should not be expanding NATO. In fact, I strongly believe that we should de-Americanize Europe. I think NATO should be closed down. NATO is nothing more than an arms merchant front. Uh, they're there to sell weapons that don't work. And oh, by the way, if you buy an American weapon, be very aware that there's probably an off switch installed. You're buying something that can be turned off by the Americans. I wouldn't do it. Wow. Well, you're, you're calling for uh, policymakers to stop doing bad stuff, but it seems that there's an incentive to keep doing this bad stuff in each of these seven different foreign policy organizations or however you want to slice it up. Uh, what would it take to actually turn things around? Could it be done for the political system and your political efforts, which include a previous run for president and now uh, run for the libertarian nomination for president? Uh, how, how promising do you see this kind of political activity? Well, uh, there, 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 are, there are actually three levels of potential change. Let me start with the billionaires, because I think that Lady Lynn Rothschild and her conference on inclusive capitalism, which was held in, in June of 2014 in London, was most extraordinary. Um, Lady Rothschild, who most people don't realize is a babe from Virginia, uh, I mean from uh, New Jersey, who married well, uh, she's a gentle lady with a brain. And she realizes, as do the um, black sheep billionaires of Silicon Valley, who are talking about redemptive capitalism, they all realize what the Koch brothers have not realized, which is a 100% corrupt government is not working. It's killing the golden goose, the, the public, the engine of productivity is being killed, and they're starting to realize what the wealthy realized in New York City in 1920, when infectious disease 
was jumping from the ghettos to the mansions. We're all connected. There is no redoubt in Switzerland that will keep the extreme wealthy safe if they allow us to go past a point of no return. So I give very high credit to Lady Lynn Rothschild and to a lesser extent uh, to some of the other billionaires. I'm uncertain about George Sotos because he seems to do as much damage as good uh, on any given day, but perhaps he could be saved. And of course, with my vision of open source everything, I would like to think the open source society might be interested in this. Uh, the Shuttleworth Foundation just recognized me, and I'm hoping to actually create an open source everything agency. Um, so the billionaires, among the billionaires, a, a handful of them are starting to recognize that we need to do something. And if I could connect with Lady Lynn Rothschild, I would propose to her that she support an open source technologies agency, which is what I have proposed to Vice President Biden. At the second level, the political level, I cannot imagine a more ridiculous spectacle in the United States of America than the bitch versus the butthead. You have Hillary Clinton, a proven criminal, against Donald Trump, who is a moron who not only can't make money, he can't even inherit wealth. He's the laughingstock of his, of his billionaire circle in New York. They don't take him seriously. Um, you have some good people, Kasich uh, and O'Malley, although O'Malley stole all the furniture from the governor's mansion, uh, had it downgraded to junk and paid $9,000 for $65,000. But this is the first year, 2016 is the first year in which if I could get John Huntsman to run as an independent and announce a coalition cabinet and a balanced budget and demand an electoral reform act in time for the 20 to 30 vacated seats to be occupied by libertarians, greens, independents, reform party, working families, then in 2016 we could have an honest White House that is not beholden to the two-party tyranny and we could break the back of the two-party tyranny in Congress. Okay, That's the second level. The third level is public. And one of the problems that we're having is that the Internet is actually more controlled than people realize. And Eric Schmidt has come out with the latest insanity, saying that he wants to be able to censor the Internet and censor hate speech. Well, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And me calling Eric Schmidt a moron is a very important statement, as I did today, but if he censors that, nobody hears that voice. He probably um, thinks that's hate speech. Yes, of course he thinks that's hate speech. Well, I think he's a Zionist. I also think Google has done great evil. I know Larry Page personally. When, when Vince Cerf went to Google, I bought him sushi, and I said, for God's sakes, at least get Google to make some sense. Give us tools with which to make sense. Now, Micah Sifri has written an excellent book called The Big Disconnect, why the Internet hasn't transformed politics yet. And it's from two problems that the people have, three problems that the people have. Number one, the people are selfish. Every nonprofit group is selfish. They're all about their hashtag. They will not come together and work. I tried to get the Greens and the Libertarians to agree to run a joint presidential campaign with a, a Green vice president, a Libertarian president, and then a coalition cabinet from across the board. They refused. They're not willing to work together. So that's problem. Number, C Cynthia huh? McKinney, uh, who is actually participating in this book. Um, I love Cynthia yeah. McKinney. Yeah, she wants to do this, something like this. I, I've well, she and I have had many conversations about this. Now, I'll tell you what I want. I want $1 million so that I can bribe Ron Paul, Dennis Kucinich, Jesse Ventura, Ralph Nader, and then honor Cynthia McKinney, Jill Stein, um, Bill uh, Blasio, de Blasio from New York, uh, Ross Perot, Pat Buchanan. I want to bring out all of the past presidential candidates and a number of brilliant minds such as Cornell West, David Corton, yourself, Chris Hedges, uh, Matt Tobby. I want to have an electoral reform summit in the United States in January. And then I want to mobilize Occupy and I want to have them shit on the front lawn of every member of Congress. Did I say shit or sit? I meant both. Uh, on the front lawn of every member of Congress until they pass the Electoral Reform Act of 2016. If they pass that act, I can get John Huntsman elected, I can get a coalition cabinet elected, and I can put 20 free thinkers into Congress who will be a swing vote, and they will be elected 
contingent on their agreeing to not caucus with the two-party tyranny. So at that level, we can also win. There's lots of stuff we can do, but right now the billionaires are sitting on the sidelines. They're not sure what to do. And what I, my message for the billionaires is very simple. We have gone from the age of agriculture to the industrial era to the information era. We're now moving into the age of virtue, of ethics, truth, and virtue. When I wrote the Open Source Everything Manifesto, the subtitle is Transparency, Truth, and Trust. What I would say to the billionaires is if you want truth and reconciliation from the 99%, then let us have our 1% to restore integrity to the government and get out of our way, and we will show you wealth creation like you would not believe. Well, that sounds like a good program to me, and I, I look forward to trying to help it make it happen. Um, and I, I hope that the exposure of these gross deceptions, really the big emotionally charged deceptions that keep people imprisoned in a matrix of illusion, will be a part of waking people up to the point that something like this can actually happen. Well, thank you, uh, Robert David Steele. It's been a pleasure, as always. I appreciate your terrific work. And uh, from all of us at the False Flag Islamophobia Conference, uh, thank you. Well, I thank you, and I would just remind people that subscriptions at phibetaiota.net are free, and of course I'm grateful for donations as I have no salary, no pension, and no savings. I can relate. <laughs> thank you again, and uh, now back to the live streaming False Flag Islamophobia Conference. Welcome back. This is the False Flag Islamophobia Conference. You just heard from Robert David Steele, former CIA uh, clandestine services officer. And we have more expertise coming up uh, from former insider, current whistleblower, another guy who knows how this stuff really works because he was there on the inside seeing the counter-terror world from the official viewpoint until... Well, did he take the red pill, or did somebody force it down his throat by showing him some of the wrong information, or he just dug up the wrong information? Anyway, let's hear about it from the man himself. Uh, Scott Bennett, a former counterterrorism specialist from the U.S. Army, who's worked for Special Operations Command, Central Command, State Department, uh, Bush administration, all the way up to uh, various privatized entities. Uh, so, Scott, uh, welcome, and thank you for joining the Real War on Terror. Kevin, it's an honor to be with you, and I, I have to applaud you for your courage and your character and the men standing next to you, but you have a special place in my heart for being one of the, one of the first bold leaders to start, uh, I mean, just advancing truth, so I'm honored to be with you. Well, th thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Um, so the conference is about false flag Islamophobia, and a theme that developed at the mainstream UC Berkeley sponsored conference that we attended yesterday, but it never fully broke out into the open, was that Islamophobia is the bedrock foundation on which uh, a global police state is being built. This is going all around all over the world, especially in the West. The U.S. may be the leader, as in so many things, but it's happening almost everywhere, including here in France, where we are locked down under martial law. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about how your perspective on the so-called war on terror evolved and, and to what extent you would kind of agree with that perspective about Islamophobia. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. And I prepared a, a brief uh, PowerPoint that I could go through in about five minutes and then jump right into elaborating. And then, of course, we'll have the questions and answers. So if we go through that, I'll just talk over it and, and synthesize what you've just questioned on. Uh, and let Alan just advance the uh, slides. And you're right. I mean, I was in the heart of the information psychological warfare community. I was an army officer. I was given a direct commission. I worked at Booz Allen Hamilton. I had a top secret SEI clearance. I was at the State Department counterterrorism office. I was at U.S. Special Operations Command. I was at U.S. Central Command. I was tracking the money. And when I discovered a lot of the money was coming from Swiss banks, I've started to talk talk out about it, and I was very thankful to have made your acquaintance and, and begin that conversation. So my background was at the 11th Psychological Operations Battalion, which the uh, emblem on the right is the sword with a quill, 
and that's exploiting information. That's discovering intelligence and writing about it. And and truth is the ultimate psyop. And what I discovered uh, in my weird Alice in Wonderland world was a Swiss banker, Brad Birkenfeld, which dovetails with a lot of your experts who've been talking about following the money. This man was the Swiss banker who brought 19,000 bank accounts, a lot of which were owned by uh, Saudi Arabia, Gulf states, Kuwait, Qatar, that were being used to funnel to these ISIS, CIA, Mossad mercenaries. And he brought it forth and he was thrown in prison. I met him, I debriefed him, and I sent reports up the chain of command as a good soldier, as an officer serving my country, and nothing was ever done. No one in Congress, no one in the military, no one in the media ever did anything about it. Uh, Michael Hastings, of course, saw it and started to investigate. We know he was killed quite quite later. Uh, this picture up there is very precise for your situation, Kevin, because that's my conversation with a French intelligence agent back in January, February of 2015. I'm sorry, it was a little bit after February because it was in response to the Charlie Hebdo attacks that occurred. I contacted French intelligence and I briefed them uh, about Brad Birkenfeld and his Swiss bank material. He was going to France to debrief the judge and I I uh, talked with the French intelligence guy and I said, look, you have to explore the terrorist financing elements. You have to explore these bank accounts and all the information that uh, shows that you know terrorism is funded through this and he refused to do anything I never was debriefed I was never allowed to provide the information uh, so that shows you that they they were fully knowledgeable about these attacks so your false flag theory is accurate and what I've got on there and I've sent you a copy so you can give it to people this PowerPoint but this is the the key international treaties and, and laws that the United States is using to uh, confiscate money and to prosecute this quote war on terror. I call it the 9-11 wars because it was all started with the trigger point of 9-11. So the international laws and treaties that the United States and the international community is using as their license to create the martial law that has you under lockdown, create the martial law on the Boston, bon Bo Boston Marathon bombing uh, and elsewhere uh, these are also the instruments that we need to use to defend against it and to attack against it in a legal uh, constitutional basis. So a lot of the banking presentations that I've been trained in are what you see in front of you. Nothing's classified, but it's what the uh, powers of the police state use to train their people. And that's very important for us to learn if uh, we're going to defeat the enemies of freedom and, and uh, honesty and virtue is learning what they are uh, training their soldiers in. So what you see is what I was trained in and it's what everyone who uh, begins to become involved in the research and the articulation of these ideas needs to become. Uh, so that's just a, a brief overview of, of some of the material and it's designed to help your audience become intelligence assets and uh, use this material wisely. So this is a time for action. This is a time for uh, uniting and becoming uh, increasingly networked and educated on our skills. The materials I put up there are, are uh, uh, the documents and the research that I've uh, acquired in my adventure in this world. Uh, in the terrorist finance, in the information operation, in the government sectors. And they, uh, the final slide is, of course, the very quick matrix of the people that were involved with my discovery, which is the Union Bank of Switzerland, Brad Birkenfeld, the Swiss, the Swiss bank whistleblower who brought this information out. Edward Snowden uh, was connected to it because he was the uh, CIA contractor that was pursuing Birkenfeld. He also worked at my firm, Booz Allen Hamilton. And it also incidentally connects Eric Holder, Lanny Brewer, and President Obama, and Hillary Clinton, because they're all tied to the law firm Covington and Burling in Washington, D.C., which represents these Swiss banks that are funding money in CIA black operations and to these mercenary forces that we see in Syria. And uh, it is, of course, I agree with all the speakers, and I was most... Uh, pleased with your Islamic scholar uh, gentleman because he's exactly right. There is, there is a an enormous danger of a world war, nuclear war coming up. Uh, there is a de-Americanization of Europe happening. I think it's going to backfire though because I think Europe uh, is going to realign with Russia, divorce the United States, 
And they could very quickly have a revolution in Europe that is geared towards what the Islamic gentleman was talking about, exposing these uh, corrupt bad actors, these bad government people, these bad bankers who are on the agenda of global hegemony and global control of the masses and the stupefying of people. And, well, Scott, uh, we, we, just learned, we just learned from uh, No Lies Radio headquarters that we're going to have your power going up at the archive of this show. So the same link that people are using to watch live right now will be an archive of the show, and there they will find the PowerPoint so they can actually see those details that you were showing people. Sure. But, you know, I, I wanted to ask whether, you know, Sheikh Imran Hussein is suggesting that they've got this ISIS snowballing so much now that they've actually got a stable of people who are from Muslim backgrounds who are joining and have joined uh, this so-called Islamic State, the pseudo-Islamic State, and so they may be able to rely on there being a big wave of terrorism coming from such people, and they wouldn't have to uh, do things quite as artificially using uh, mercenary special forces types as they have in the past, and he's expecting a huge wave of terrorism, and of course that would mean more and more and more Islamophobia, more hysteria like we're seeing in both in France and the USA from people like Trump. Uh, and You're hoping though that uh, people will wake up fast enough to preempt this. Well, let's look at history as our instructor mode for dealing with this. In history, we had Martin Luther nailing uh, the theories to the door in Geneva of his objections uh, that have been perpetrated against the, the, the Christendom, the Christian body. And we also have in the we U.S. Constitution... We nailed our objections. I'm sorry, Scott. We, we nailed our objections to the door of the mainstream UC Berkeley Islamophobia Conference. <laughs> I love it. Well, you're, you're we're, you know, like minds think alike, I suppose, because the next, uh, the next example of history, of course, is the United States Constitution, where they nailed a list of grievances and abuses and violations against the American people against the door of Britain and it was in the formation of a Declaration of Independence. Now we similarly in this conference through your leadership and the brilliant men's and minds that are putting this and synthesizing it together and, and distilling from it actionable truth, we need to take this and nail it to the Christian Church in America, the, uh, the uh, mosques in America, the uh, Jewish relig religious centers in America and say good people of the United States unite and discover and actionalize this because a great deception is being put upon us, a great delusion is being put into the public mind that we need to inoculate ourselves from and guess what you do have a uh, wave, a tidal wave, a tsunami of human zombies and robots that may be coming in that the Islamic cleric uh, and, and mosque establishment needs to engage directly because they're going to listen and could be deprogrammed and could be woken up out of that that intoxication, that delusion, uh, similar to the Christian let me, let me church. Throw in that the the polls show a very very low rate of expressed support for Islamic State among Muslims. Uh, sort of five percent is about as high as they can get it. And then likewise, we have hundreds and hundreds of Muslim scholars who've signed statements uh, denouncing the so-called Islamic State or Daesh. And there's basically no established Islamic scholar that I've ever heard of that supports them. And so the question becomes: Why hasn't the public heard this? And how can Muslims possibly say this more clearly? Well, the internet, of course, is the invention of the tank and the dark ages, if you will. The internet is providing people the instrument to uh, throw up the skywriting for all to see of ideas such as your broadcast. And the internet is an instrument of, of salvation and awakening and, and inspiring, and, and uh, we're trying to do that by leading people, giving them examples of leadership. And people just need to be trained in the tactics. A great Vietnam friend of mine said one of the best weapons of war is dropping a big ant bomb onto a tank, a big nest of ants, because it floods in and it, it bites and the, the enemies run for the hills. And the Internet is that ant bomb. A hundred thousand, a million people listening to your broadcast can suddenly write their representatives, call their representatives, call their media, call their military bases, send documentation and it feels like a million stinging ants suddenly you've taken the initiative and you're on the the aggressive attack and you can't be defensive when we're defensive we get attacked with these silly false flag uh, operations 
So you have to be aggressive and proactive and attack them directly. Um, one other thing I was I was I was going to uh, uh, say on the uh, on the false flag uh, attacking is related to our Declaration of Independence and penning and nailing the grievances that we had against the British King. We need to nail in the legal courts of law a grievances against our own government agencies and key figures. Uh, you you will recall the various objections and grievances and abuses that the founding fathers nailed were not simply theories or dreams or, or bad emotions, but they were documented incidents and cases of violation of U.S. citizens, violation of their property, violation of their homes. Those were documented. There were reports that were written. There were testimonies given in court. So there, were, there was a vast documented uh, reservoir of the actual physical events that occurred that were abusing citizens that the Founding Fathers distilled into their one-line objections and put those one lines into the Declaration of Independence. We can take our own personal experiences in whistleblowing, in uh, the abuses that occurred, such as John uh, Caracal, uh, myself, I know what I know, and that is Swiss banks, terrorist financing, its connection to the top leaders of the American government, and their failure through conscious effort, through their conscious omission to act, their violation of the Constitution, their violation against, quote, the safety and happiness and tranquility of the American public. And we can build a legal case. We can file it as free citizens. We don't need lawyers. We can go into a courtroom and file a complaint uh, that establishes these false flag, act, false flag acts are violations of the Constitution. We're filing legitimate acts of law and grievance uh, redressing in the courts and that is another instrument of attack. It's not defensive, it's attack. We need to attack through legal, constitutional, and informational means these agents, these bodies, these politicians that are attacking our people in the United States. They're attacking people's sense of safety and happiness. And let's reflect on the foundation of the document itself, the Constitution of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, safety and happiness was the whole purpose for separating from Great Britain. Safety and happiness is the whole purpose from separating from this war on terrorism, 9-11 war, false flag, information, Islamophobia, uh, PSYOP that has been perpetrated against the United States. And here, here, we need to get much more aggressive. Uh, you know, my colleague, Anthony Hall, who's kind of a specialist in rewriting North American history, from a Canadian viewpoint that, you know, takes away a lot of our national mythology that you and I, as U.S. Americans, share, uh, wanted to make a, a quick point. Yeah, well, I want to uh, agree with you that we need to do legal actions. Uh, we did attempt in 2009 when George W. Bush came to Calgary to uh, do a citizen's arrest of George W. Bush, and I worked closely with uh, Splitting the Sky, unfortunately the late Splitting the Sky, a Mohawk activist. And uh, of course the Mohawks were very close allies of the British Empire in the era, you know, you, you're, you're speaking, I think, Scott, as if there was a United States before 1776, but of course there wasn't, there was British North America. And in this famous uh, Declaration of Independence, you know, after the famous phrase about uh, uh, liberty and equality and fraternity and these, uh, well, this is the French Revolution, but the uh, uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, these, you know, in inspirational phrases suggesting, you know, an, an equality of human beings uh, and government deriving authority from uh, popular uh, will. Uh, but then most of the Declaration of Independence is, a, as you say, a kind of legal condemnation, a, a legal case against King George for being a tyrant and uh, thus justifying the taking up of arms because he'd lost his legitimacy. And uh, 
it, you know, it's interesting to imagine that, of course, this King George is still the sort of head of state of Canada, and that, you know, his descendant is now Queen Elizabeth, and, and uh, so we, you know, we've managed to uh, make something of our country under this uh, tyrannical um, British system that was uh, re rebelled against in the American Revolution. But if you go through this list of uh, indictments, the last one uh, is uh, referring to the merciless Indian savages. And it's a condemnation that King George kind of acknowledged the human rights of indigenous peoples. And it says, King George did bring on the merciless Indian savages whose known means of warfare is undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In other words, these merciless Indian savages were terrorists. They were capable of doing indiscriminate uh, violence towards men, women, and children, and they couldn't be recognized within this framework of universal human rights. And to me, this is really significant because the global war on terror, you know, kind of makes the new merciless Indian savages into Muslims uh, and uh, jihadists, and you know, this whole um, imagery of Islamic terrorism kind of continues the metaphors that go right back to the very roots of the United States. And let's remember that the people being criminalized are the people on the resources that the United States is being created to take over and annex and own these resources. So this question of you know, how we frame the enemy, you referred to the enemy. And you know, in, in a per perfect world, of course, we want to love one another and embrace our mutual, uh, you know, our deep rooted human attributes, uh, but in fact, you know, when you get into the psychology of war, which you're an expert on, uh, there, you, there is this concept of the, the good us and the enemy other, and of course, um, when you refer to that, uh, it seems that Muslims generically are somehow being crafted as the uh, other, and who would benefit from this? What interests would this serve? And I think there's no escaping the fact that there's an Israeli situation, the Israeli state founded in 1948 is in a neighborhood where they're surrounded by um, uh, people who are Arab, who are predominantly Muslim. In fact, the country is on the territory of the indigenous peoples. Um, you know, it's not just the West Bank or Gaza, it's the whole structure of the, the country. So when we think about having to uh, divide the world into those who are um, you know, have a chance of banding together to uh, triumph in some sort of uh, humanitarian way, and those who are challenging that, how do, how do we structure that? Who benefited from 9-11? Who's benefiting from the global war on terror? You know, Tony, Scott can speak directly to some of this, because you know, I'd like to ask you, Scott, hey, you know, you work directly under Rabbi Dov Zakheim. Yeah. Now, Rabbi Dov Zakheim is apparently, a, allegedly, a dual citizen. He's certainly a rabid Zionist an Israeli-American rabbit Zionist. Why was that man ever made comptroller of the Pentagon and put in charge of all of our military money? And then while he was comptroller, $2.3 trillion disappeared from the coffers of the Pentagon. That is seven times the then annual defense budget. Then the same rabid Zionist, loyal to Israel and maybe to the USA or maybe not, was became CEO of Booz Allen Hamilton and its counterterror operations where you worked. How, did you ever ask yourself, how could someone fanatically loyal to a genocidal foreign state that has attacked the United States and documented acts of terrorism like the Liberty attack, uh, that false flag attack designed to be blamed on Egyptians, how could such a man be put in such a position? Uh, what are your thoughts on working for Dov Zekheim? Well, I'm going to include a lot of that material in your book, Kevin, that you were kindly uh, invited me to participate in, and so it's going to be included in that paragraph. The other thing about Dove Zakheim is I was employed by Colonel Jeff Jones, the father of modern PSYOP. He was the Merlin of all psychological warfare, and he brought me in knowing my character and knowing who I was and said, I'm going to send you down, and you're going to work for Dove Zakheim. You're going to work in counterterrorism threat finance, and and a lot of things developed. When they discovered who I was and what I was doing, that's when I was attacked and yanked out. But there's a very interesting, again, a legal case for treason and prosecution in the international court, the European court, as well as the United States. That is Dove Zakheim, 
ran the money operations for Booz Allen Hamilton. His son was at the U.S. House Armed Services Committee and chairman or was the deputy uh, legal counsel and staff director at the U.S. House Armed Services Committee. When I filed reports to that U.S. House Armed Services Committee, his son, Roger Zakheim, covered his dad, burned my reports, didn't let them go up to the proper members of Congress, and then Roger Zakheim went to work for the law firm Covington & Burling, which represented the very Swiss banks that I was exposing. So he went to the law firm that was defending these Swiss banks, and he went there with Eric Holder and Lanny Brewer, who were the, was the attorney general and the assistant attorney general that prosecuted the UBS whistleblower in concert with Hillary Clinton. So the cover-up and the conspiracy and the government uh, corruption is there in black and white, and that's what I discovered, that's what I documented, and that's the evidence. How people can get into positions like that, it's because of their, their uh, Mossad, Israeli, uh, neoconservative, uh, godless humanism agenda, uh, as Wesley Clark uh, sort of laid out, I don't have a tremendous amount of honor for Wesley Clark because a true officer and a soldier would stand up relentlessly until he is killed and speak out against it to, for the very purposes of leading the humanity that have empowered him as an officer of the United States military. They've empowered him with that, uh, that trust. He would never stop making it known to the citizens about the dangers that you're wisely pointing out in this conference. And Wesley Clark and others sort of they popped up a little bit, but they went down. Uh, RT and Press TV are good instruments for getting this information out. Uh, they do have some flawed characters there, like General Flynn of the DIA. He knew all about my reports exposing terrorist fi financing in Swiss banks, and he did absolutely nothing. And, you know, these sorts of people are, they have a lot to answer for. And that, that's all that I'm driven by is as a soldier, as an officer, who discovered this accidentally, discovered 9-11 was not what I was told it was, and when I discovered it, suddenly my eyes go into color from the previous black and white world, and now I have new information, and now I'm channeling it up, and the hope of reforming this is through, I think, a big part, the military people who are coming back from these wars, running for Congress, and making this stuff known. Military men are very powerful, and women, Probably military women are even more powerful than military men because they're trained, they're knowledgeable, and they have a fearless character and a love of country and an oath not to men in Washington, not to the president, but an oath to the Constitution, which is about freedom, safety, happiness, domestic tranquility. And when we discover our own government forces and agents and congressmen have participated in this cover-up, then we no longer we don't have an oath to them. We have an oath to the people who put us in as in positions as military officers and say we need to prosecute these people. Well, uh, amen to all of that. Thank you, Scott Bennett. Uh, I appreciate your brave whistleblowing. Um, I look forward to seeing the PowerPoint, which people will be able to see as soon as this conference, shortly after when the conference is archived, at this same link that we're broadcasting on live. Uh, so keep up the great work. God bless you. And I also look forward to your uh, article. God bless you. Salam alaikum, Kevin. Thanks so much for what you're doing. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, great work, Scott Bennett. Well, we're now going to welcome our next guest, Brandon Martinez. Now, Brandon Martinez is a young, up-and-coming, hard-hitting journalist who is well-known in particular for not shying away from discussing the power of world Zionism, the Zionist lobby in the United States. This kind of a discussion is censored, it's self-censored, uh, even to a certain extent at the mainstream Islamia, Islamophobia conference that we were at yesterday, there are probably some red lines that most of the people there wouldn't ever cross. Uh, the left gatekeepers like Noam Chomsky say there is no such thing as any Israel lobby. Israel and Zionism have no power in the United States whatsoever. And this guy is the leading supposed dissident critic and truth seeker uh, standing up for moral critique as a public intellectual. Um, Brandon Martinez is doing a service, I think, by challenging that kind of thinking and uh, offering a, a very hard-hitting skeptical view that focuses on Zionist power. Um, so let's give him a hearing. Uh, welcome, Brandon Martinez. How are you? 
it's, it's good to see you all. It's good to see Tony and uh, Giroid finally. We've been uh, talking on Facebook. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, basically, uh, I've written into this article called uh, Decoding the Paris Attacks, uh, ISIS Blowback or French-Israeli False Flag, right, which you've decided to include in your book. And, you know, uh, we, we can go through all the hallmarks of false flag terrorism. You know, we could look at the uh, foreknowledge of the attacks, you know, go into the backstories of some of these individuals, which uh, which I do in the opening chapter. Um, you know, I, I, we, we could look at the drills that are used. I mean, time and time again, we see that every time there's a terrorist attack, there's a drill, right? There's a drill that's mimicking the attack, that uh, seems to be uh, exactly as the attack turns out to be. So we've seen this in, in, in New York on 9-11, right? We saw this in London on 7-7. We saw this, as Tony has, has documented, uh, in, in Ottawa during the, uh, the October 22nd shooting where uh, authorities were literally running drills in the weeks leading up to the event that was depicting ISIS-style attacks. And again, we see in Paris, uh, they were running a mass shooter drill on the very day of the attacks where, uh, you know, authorities are essentially running the, the, the very event that happens later in the day. So what are we to conclude about that? Are we to conclude that every time there's one of these drills, that this is a coincidence, that the authorities just happen to be running drills on the day of a terror attack that is exactly as it turns out to be? Um, so that that's obviously one indicator that of a false flag attack, but, uh, you know, when we look at the Charlie Hebdo operation, which which you've been discussing, uh, you know the the two individuals involved in that, the Kuwachi brothers, were well known to the authorities, right? They were on watch lists. They were, one of them had been charged with terrorism years before in 2005. He was, uh, you know, ostensibly charged for trying to join Al Qaeda. So they were watched. They were definitely under surveillance. And while this is happening, you know, while the the intelligence agencies are tracking them, they're able to they're able this this absolute freedom of movement, right? So they go to the Middle East, they link up with militants, they link up with terrorist groups, and then they're able somehow to move back into Europe, go through all the security checkpoints that you normally go through. You know, if you're going to go on a flight, you're going to go through security. There's no possible way that individuals on a terror watch list can just traipse in and out of these countries without any interference from authorities. And we see the same thing with this Paris attack uh, that just took place. We see that some of the gunmen were on terror watch lists. Sammy Amimor, one of the gunmen, was on a terror watch list. He was supposedly uh, convicted of a terrorism offense in 2012 for trying to go to Yemen, and then he somehow uh, evades the authorities, gets to Syria, somehow gets back into France. What, how does that how does that compute with the fact that France is a police state that just passed one of the most Orwellian surveillance laws in the world uh, in January? They passed a surveillance law which gave authorities unlimited surveillance prowess. They could wiretap your phone. They could plant cameras and audio equipment in your house and keylogger equipment on your computer. So how is it that known uh, known radicals, known people? are able to move in and out of Europe and link up with terrorists in the Middle East and come back without being without being picked off. It's simply not feasible. We look at the the head of this alleged ring that did this attack. His name's Abdul Hamid Aboud. This guy was well known in Belgium. He was actually a household name because he had joined ISIS in 2013, had recruited his younger brother into ISIS, and this was headline news all over Belgium. He was actually charged in Belgium in 2014 in absentia for allegedly uh, recruiting people into ISIS. And then, at the same time that he's you know, charged, he's uh, being pursued by the authorities, uh, he goes back into Belgium in 2015 in January. We're told that he somehow makes his way back into the country, somehow plots uh, an attack in Belgium, with accomplices, so all the logistical hurdles that you'd expect to encounter. You know, first of all, getting into the country. Did he take a plane? Did he go on a boat? It's never explained. Uh, how did he recruit these people? How did he get communications to be able to, you know, 
gather these 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 operatives in one place? How did he secure the safe house? How did they secure the weapons for this operation? So in so in this attack in in, in January 2015, Belgian police allegedly foiled it and killed two of his accomplices, but he somehow escapes. And this is where the story just gets very strange. Uh, we're told that he gave an interview to the ISIS magazine, right, Dabiq, in, in uh, June of this year. And he was bragging about how easy it was, allegedly, to evade authorities. This is what he said. He said, my name and picture were all over the news, yet I was able to stay in their homeland, plan operations against them, and leave safely when doing so became necessary. Uh, he goes on to say this, I was even stopped by an officer who contemplated me so as to care, compare me to the picture, but he let me go as he didn't see the resemblance. So we're, we're being asked to believe here that this mastermind of the Paris attack was well known to the police, was all over the media, his picture everywhere, they're pursuing him, they'd already charged him in Belgium, was able to go to the Middle East, join ISIS, come back into Belgium, plan an operation, fail, and then a policeman stops him looks at the picture, looks at him, and just says, oops, I didn't. I made a mistake, let him go. And then we're told he leaves back to Syria. Again, the problem of how did he get there, the plane. Was it a plane or a boat? How did he get there? So he goes back, and then we're told he comes back again into Europe to plan this Paris attack from within, uh, you know, right under the noses of the French authorities. He somehow makes it into France again. He somehow... Uh, accrues all the weapons, the AK-47s, the ammunition, the explosives. He secures a safe house. You cannot get a gun in France, uh, let alone a terrorist who's on a watch list who's wanted by the authorities. You cannot get all these weapons without being picked off by the intelligence. And, and one excuse they might come up with is that, oh, they got it on the black market. Well, we know the black market is controlled by intelligence. That's how they run their covert operations and off the books uh, operation. So uh, even if that's the case, uh, it's it's not an excuse for for how this individual secured these weapons. So th this doesn't make any sense at all, right? He he's this guy is supposedly a poltergeist who is able to just move in and out of Europe, back to to ISIS to engage in combat, back to Europe, evading authorities, evading police, evading the security surveillance apparatus, which is 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 uh, just you know, it's an Orwellian state of affairs in France after Charlie Hebdo where anybody can be wiretapped without a warrant. So there's no possible way he could have done all of this unless, of course, he was an asset. And that's that's what essentially what I posit here. And, uh, you know, let's just go into some of the forewarnings. Uh, you know, there's a, a website called SoftRep run by ex-Special Forces guys, and they reported that uh, two weeks before the attacks, French National Police met with German police and uh, were discussing an imminent pre-planned terrorist attack. So the idea that this was not known about is simply ludicrous. We can go to the Associated Press who put out a report uh, right after the attack saying that Iraqi intelligence officials warned France and other members of the US coalition that ISIS was planning assaults, imminently planning assaults in Europe. Uh, the French tried to downplay this saying, "Oh." It was just non-specific, but it was very specific, and they went on to clarify that they shared, quote, uh, specific details which French authorities, including the size of a sleeper cell of militants, they said were directing the attackers. So France clearly had foreknowledge. We, we can go back to September when French intelligence picked off an ISIS guy coming into Europe, and this was reported by France 24, where uh, they say that... Uh, a French national suspected of planning a terrorist attack in France after returning from Islamic State territory was arrested and he admitted to police that he had been instructed to carry out attacks on specifically concert halls. Right. So this is two months before this operation. French intelligence get a tip, pick off this guy, and he says ISIS is planning attacks in France against concerts. They were meeting with German police discussing this plan. They got a tip from the Iraqis. They got two warnings from Turkey that an individual was involved in this named uh, Ishmael Mostafi. They claim he was involved in this attack. Turkey says they warned Fran France about him twice, 
in the year leading up to this. So there was plenty of, of foreknowledge, plenty of forewarnings. Then there's the the warning that came in from uh, that was reported by the Times of Israel. The Times of Israel reported that French Jewish uh, security officials in France uh, were warned of an imminent terror attack on the very day of the attack. They said it was in the morning they were warned. Then they changed the story, revised it, and said that it was uh, a warning that had been ongoing for months. Essentially, they tried to whitewash it by making it sound ambiguous that they there, this warning was you know, ongoing, but Essentially, well, they changed the news story. They published a news story saying they'd been warned that day, uh, that morning, right. quite specifically, and then they erased that and they put in language making it look like it was some vague warning from long ago. Right, but it, it really doesn't matter if it was on the day or if it was months. That just if it was months in advance, that just tells me they had a longer period of foreknowledge than than one day. Uh, so that, that really doesn't do anything to discredit the, the fact that French Jewish secu security officials were tipped off, probably by the Mossad, of an imminent terror attack. Now, how did they know that, right? How, how would anybody know that unless this was pretty much well known to a lot of, a, a lot of these intelligence agencies, including French intelligence? Uh, so, you know, two of these guys um, that they blame for the attack, the Abdeslam brothers, uh, were well known to authorities as well. They were on a list of 80 so-called uh, Islamic radicals that was on the desk of the mayor of Molenbeek in Belgium, the city they came from. This was reported by the Independent. So they were on this list that was on her desk a month before the attacks. Um, so you know, one of the things that that's reminiscent to 9/11 is that a lot of these guys that they're blaming for this attack uh, were not radical Islamists, and there's no evidence that they were, and there's plenty of evidence that they weren't. Uh, the Abdeslam brothers, let's take them. The wife of one of them, Ibrahim, said that he was fond of smoking cannabis every single day, that all he did was smoke weed, do drugs, and play video games. Uh, and he well, never was well. and, and he never went to mosque or prayed, she said. She said he had no interest in politics or current affairs, never watched TV, and that he had no gripe with the West. So him and his brother, uh, Sali Abdeslam, they claim he is the, the guy that escaped and abandoned the mission and is on the run still, and I can get into how ludicrous that story is, but he is said to have been actually gay. He went to gay bars, and he was frequenting gay bars, and he was well known in that scene as, as little as a month before the attack. So on one hand, we're, we're told that ISIS are throwing gays off of buildings and executing people for so much as drinking or smoking a cigarette you know, the other, on the other hand, they're employing gays and drug addicts as suicide terrorists in Europe. It simply is a, a fanciful narrative that, that doesn't really add up. So one week before the attacks, Belgian police shut down their bar of these two brothers. They were running a bar and uh, shut it down because they were ostensibly running drugs out of this bar. So these are drug dealers. These are not radical Islamists, these are drug addicts, and there's no reason to believe that they had been radicalized. There's no reason to believe that they had even been members of ISIS. There, they, there's no evidence they went to Syria. Um, so Saleh, the guy that they claim escaped, they're saying that he had second thoughts and he threw his suicide vest in a dumpster and that he abandoned the mission. Now because of that, they're saying that ISIS is trying to kill him. At the same time, uh, they're saying that he escaped and now he's in Syria. So if, if ISIS is trying to kill him, then why would he go to Syria? It makes absolutely no sense. There's no possible way he could have escaped. France declared martial law after the attacks, shut down the border. Belgium did the same thing. It was complete lockdown. This was reported on the day of the attacks that Hollande locked the border. He couldn't have escaped. It's impossible. There was thousands of soldiers and police all over the streets with his picture everywhere. There's no way he could have escaped. At the same time, on the day of the attacks, we're told that Abdeslam gets in the car, calls some friends, and makes his way back to Belgium, and he was stopped by police three times and released each time. This was reported in Toronto Sun. So as they're hunting for him, they have his poster and picture everywhere, they actually had the chance to arrest him three times and release him each time. To me, now this tells me that he's protected. He's an asset. He, there's no way that the French police are just bumbling idiots and 
decide to release this most wanted terrorist with the biggest manhunt in, in European history yeah, three we, we could separate times. One, one Inspector Clouseau, we could believe re two Inspector Clouseaus, three Inspector Clouseaus is too much. Did the investigator uh, commit suicide like the prior... Uh, well, no, I haven't heard of any suicides of police investigators this time like we had with Enrique Fredou, who supposedly uh, shot himself in the head the very night of the Charlie Hebdo attacks, we're told. Uh, that was, you, you know that story, of course. One in the morning, he's in his office, stayed up late, called home, said he wouldn't be home because he had a hot lead, and uh, his supervisor had ordered him off the case. And then the next thing you know, he's dead with a bullet in the head. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Brandon, it's, there's so much of this information. We only have a few minutes, and we're going to have to wrap up the conference, mm -hmm. but just can you give me a, a quick takeaway on why this kind of information, which is not exactly hidden, it's hidden in plain sight, why isn't this penetrating the thick skulls of so many people in this world, uh, including people whose bailiwick is Islamophobia? Well, the main reason is, of course, the media. The media is very powerful. The media controls people's minds through just pumping out the propaganda 24-7 and most people get their information not from the alternative media but still get their information from from mainstream media and a lot of this stuff is emotional it's emotional propaganda right it, it's it's playing on people's emotions and their fears and this this sucks them into believing these fanciful narratives they don't want to think critically when they're told this story of good and evil right good and evil we're good they're bad we need to go save the world that's the sort of black and white narrative that we're being fed um, one, one other point I wanted to make before we we end is is you know Fr Francis Hollande the, the president of France is essentially resurrecting Bush era neoconservative propaganda talking points of uh, France is a country of freedom, he said, and they're attacking us because of our freedom. This is absolutely comical because France is not a country of freedom. It has the most repressive laws in the world uh, regarding freedom of speech. They have Holocaust denial and hate speech laws. They arrest pro-Palestinian activists for uh, voicing their support of Palestine. They arrest comedians for tweeting and, and posting comments on Facebook. They passed a law in January making it illegal to condone terrorism and arrested about a hundred people including an eight-year-old. Uh, so this is the most uh, tyrannical, one of the most tyrannical governments in the world claiming to be uh, a bastion of freedom. And uh, Hollande is, is absolutely hypocritical claiming that that France is now in a war with ISIS. Hollande is one of the fathers of ISIS, as is the U.S., Israel, and their their stooges. Right? France was instrumental in creating the rebel groups in Syria, funding, training, and arming them. You know, this this is these are the things that were reported in early 2012 when this thing started to kick off. So France is neck deep, neck deep in this terrorist campaign in Syria. So what we're seeing now is is essentially a public relations sleight of hand where they're trying to convince the world that they're out to destroy ISIS but what this is what this is intended to do is distance the fathers of ISIS from their own creation to essentially wash their hands of this murderous proxy force that they created and it's 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 very powerful propaganda you know to say oh look we're at war with ISIS now our intention is to destroy ISIS and forget about all that history of us funding arming and training them forget about all the the facts of of the operation against Syria that, that was conceived in 2007 with Israel, the United States, and Saudi Arabia to destroy Assad, to destroy Iran and Hezbollah, right? That is the agenda. So while they can claim this and put out this propaganda, we know just based on the facts that all of this is an inverse of reality. It is essentially them flipping the script on us uh, and, and creating this charade, this facade of lies in order to confuse us. That's, that's what I take out of this, this latest campaign. Well, that sounds uh, quite reasonable based on what I've seen. Uh, it's, it's horrifying and kind of mind-boggling that the public can be maintained in such a state of uh, disinformation, but there you have it. Well, thank you so much, Brandon Martinez yeah. <clears throat> of Non-Aligned Media, and Tony Hall has yeah, a quick Yeah, we're just going to jump in here, and we're getting t towards some up time. Uh, what, a, what an honor to sit with the four of you right now and all the preceding guests. Uh, uh, Girard uh, gave uh, a really historic analysis of what happened in Paris within hours of the event, and I think it's up to two million views. And uh, you know, we discussed it a lot in class. Uh, uh, Brandon, you, I think what you just presented uh, three weeks later is by far the most uh, dense uh, factual analysis of, of, 
of the false flag event and uh, all the enormous evidence that we don't hear, for instance, yesterday at the conference on Islamophobia, where you can't even uh, raise the issue that perhaps, you know, it's not just uh, the media generating hatred towards Muslims uh, after the fact of these terrorist events, that these terror events are themselves manufactured and concocted. This is a, an uh, unspeakable issue. Um, so thank you so much for that. And I, I'd have to say, there's no doubt in my mind that you must be by far the, the best uh, most accomplished uh, journalist graduate from Sheridan College in Toronto, and I'm a Torontonian. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I know one of your uh, professors, uh, Andrew Metrogicha, who used to write at the Globe and Mail and writes in iPolitics now. But hey, Andrew, like your students running circles around you, uh, <laughs> let, 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 there, there's a mainstream figure. Come on, you, you other academics, our fellow colleagues, you know, in the academy, in the media. You can't just continue to avoid these hard issues and have any credibility. The, the discourse is going too far uh, in this type of forum. And of course, the fact that I'm able to sit here, I have to uh, owe it to Dr. Barrett, Kevin Barrett, who has been bringing people together you know, on, on a regular basis on Truth Jihad, going year after year, now going into book writing. Here we are on uh, you know, just a couple of weeks to go till uh, the second instant book where these false flags, you know, which, which become embedded in our consciousness, they, 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 they're so quickly reified. And, and so we have to act very quickly to come up with the real narratives to counter the false narratives, which are, you know, generated within minutes, within hours, somehow without any investigation. Uh, you know, they're there on the CBC was, you know, before there was any information at all, the CBC journalists were starting to float that, you know, the words Jewish school, uh, uh, you know, jihadist, uh, uh, this, this is just in, in, in the air, in, in the polluted mental environment. So I, I, I really want to acknowledge that it's Kevin that put together this amazing uh, set of commentators and pundits and people who are running circles around mainstream media and uh, the, the the academics, the people who are paid big money to do the public intellectual work, who are not doing their job. The police are not doing the job. They're not enforcing the law. The right. rule of law is becoming a sad hoax. Thanks. Well, they're being paid to not do their jobs, and we're being not paid to do their jobs for them. So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> but as I always say, there's no money in truth, you know. Yeah. Truth is bad for business. Right, right. And, well, you know, it's kind of society we're living in. It's just, you know what I mean? It's just absolutely society obsessed with money mm -hmm. and personal gain and egotism. Right. Because there's no sense of public interest. Right. Um, the public interest, the, you know, the public interest, mm -hmm. the common good, uh, the open society that uh, our colleague was talking about, the open intelligence. You know, where where is the commons? You know, this privatized world where everything must be owned and all the ownership is concentrated in so few hands. We, where is the sense of the public interest? Not in journalism, it's against the public interest. Not in police work, police work is against the public interest. Not in politics, it's just sham and theater and show. Mm -hmm. And the people who are writing the media sort of write the script, but they're just being told what to do too. It's just getting out of hands. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, colleagues, for bringing us to some kind of um, articulate state, at the very least. Well, thank you, Tony. And, you know, we do have uh, one last thing I wanted to ask, and I know we only have four minutes, and we have four people sitting here, so this is going to be really quick, almost like a yes-no question. But one of the issues that's being raised, a philosophical issue in this new book, it's uh, the sequel to We Are Not Charlie Hebdo, which was published on March 1st, uh, two and a half months after that attack. We have a sequel coming out now called Another French False Flag. Okay, and one of the philosophical issues here is, should, how should we react when we hear the news that there's been another big terror event? Um, we have, uh, on, in this book, we're going to have Gilad Atzman and uh, a couple other writers, in, Eric Wahlberg among them, arguing that we should be careful. That is, just uh, you know, jumping to conclusions that it's a false flag makes us look bad, it makes us look like conspiracy nuts and all that. So we should be very, very careful and really sift through to make sure we know what we know. And with Gilad says, all we really know about you know, 9-11 was Building 7, so that's all we should talk about. So that's the kind of conservative argument. The other argument would be the one that I'm actually leaning towards, which is at this point, 
every time this happens, every big major terror event since 9-11, maybe before 9-11 as well, has with time been shown to be a false flag since they've done it over and over and over and we've seen this pattern. My argument now is that at this point the burden of proof is on the mainstream to prove to us that it's not a false flag and we should right. be leaving from the rooftops and lighting a fire under people. Uh, Brandon, what do you right. think? Right. Well, I think the exception to the rule is that you know if these events are real then that's really just an anomaly at this point because as you said most of these things are false flags, especially the major ones. I and mean, people are going to criticize us and say that we say everything is a false flag, right? But when you look into these major events that have serious geopolitical implications, every single time uh, it turns out that it, 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 there's something more to the story. You know, it, even if it's a lie hop or a my hop, I mean, those are two things. It, it, it really doesn't make a difference at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, if the authorities knew about it and let it happen, then they are complicit in mass murder and should be tried and, and, and convicted of, of that. And we've never seen any anybody that's been involved in these operations been brought to justice since since these these false flags began decades ago, and so and it, it's just going to continue that way if people continue to nod along with the mainstream media and go along with these things. So it's up to us critical thinkers to expose these things and and to try to do something. You know, we don't have any power at this point, but um, you know, history will look favorably uh, upon people like us and and certainly give us credit for for the work we have done. Well, thank you, Brandon Martinez. I think we're at the end of our four-hour conference, the uh, alternative conference here in Paris, the sort of Salon des Refusés, uh, of those of us who <laughs> refused entry into the official salon over at the Mainstream Islamophobia Conference. We could enter, just not speak. Yeah, up. yeah, we, we could enter and ask a few questions. Uh, but here we are. Uh, thank you so much, all of you, and thank you to everybody else who participated, and thank you to the viewers who are making this conference successful by spreading the word about this. Please tell your friends, don't let people that you know be bamboozled by these frauds. The truth is out there, and uh, thank you for paying attention. I'm Kevin Barrett. This is the False Flag Islamophobia Conference at noliesradio.org. Good night. Good night.